he can hear us at least. All right, John, that sounds good. I'm, hopefully we can resolve Chester's communication problem because I'm sure he'll go away in on some of this. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Spud Woodward. I'm the chair of the uh, South Atlantic Council Private Recreational Reporting Work Group. I want to call our meeting to order. I appreciate everybody being here this morning. Uh, we've got an agenda I think everybody uh, should have received. Plus, we'll have it displayed. Uh, it never hurts to sort of uh, refresh our memory because you know we usually takes a couple of months between meetings to refresh our memory on what our goal is, and it's printed out in some of the materials. But I just wanted to, to state it for the record, and that is to develop recommendations for consideration by the council for coordinated state federal data collection and permitting programs to improve estimates of kitchen effort for private recreational snapper group or fishing activities. So, in other words, what we're looking for is. Um, a holy grail. We want uh, a no cost or low cost, easy to implement, user friendly, statistically valid, absolutely accurate and precise way of estimating catch and effort in the snapper group or fishery of the South Atlantic. So that's a, obviously an ambitious undertaking for all of us. But uh, today's agenda, uh, we'll start off. Um, with a report from John Carmichael on our previous activities, and then we've got three informational presentations that we'll have uh, on you know, specialized surveys that are currently being implemented and in some cases are considered for expansion. Uh, this is going to help us continue to better understand what's out there, uh, what works, what doesn't work, um, and what might be adapted to address our situation in the the South Atlantic. So with that, uh, John, I know you're in a little bit of a time rush, so we'll let you go ahead. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So yeah, um, move on down here in our overview to the report of the last meeting and you, you have the full report as attachment one. Um, highlighted here the goal um, that is here is the report. So if if you'll recall, we went through this. Um, we talked about the purpose of this group and how it was created. We set out a, the goal and a number of objectives and we're working through information on these objectives through this meeting and the next few that will come. At that meeting, we had an in-depth presentation on the Florida Reef Fish Survey um, being in our region and, and affecting us. And, you know, that um, had a really good discussion on that and considering what's going on in the Gulf and what's going on in the Florida and, and thinking about how things like uh, these surveys could be applied to the South Atlantic region broader. And I, I think had support for this cooperative approach that we're trying to do to see if we can find as Spud laid it out, an approach for doing this that will work across our region and avoid some of the issues that we continue to see in the Gulf and they grapple with with such a variety of state efforts that are underway. Um, and we also talked about the MRIP rare event estimation working group quite a bit. Um, you know, this has been an effort that's been underway for a while, triggered by our concerns that underlie the concerns here during dealing with these species that basically have great uncertainty in MRIP because they are rarely encountered in the survey. And many of our council stocks fall within this. And so that was a good discussion. And we had a reminder of the things that were discussed by our SSC and presented about some of the, the basic ways to deal with rare event species and the work of that working group is continuing and we'll continue to track it and update you as, as things move on there. And then the last bit of business we did at that meeting was to talk about what we wanted to do for the next meeting and really came up with a list of topics that are not just this meeting, which is the next meeting from that one, but the few meetings that will come um, next up on us. And, and so this meeting here is really, as you can see from the presentation, is very much informational about some of the different reporting things that, that move toward that holy grail as Bud so aptly described it. Um, you know, look at some of the things that are, that are in place now that affect either fishermen in our region or fishermen in some of our, our neighboring regions to see how others have solved this challenge and approached it. See what we can learn from that. And then I think the, um, Next tasks that we will do will probably be to get into some of the more logistics and nuts and bolts issues that are, that are laid out here, talking about 
you know, the barriers and, and the legality of things and the differences in state and federal roles and purposes on that. So this, the report there is available um, to see if anybody has any comments or have anything to add, you know, that you've perhaps thought of or are considered based on this report. Yeah, thank you, John. Certainly, uh, are there any comments, um, <clears throat> questions regarding the report and, and sort of the path forward that we've set for ourselves? You know, our, I think our goal is to be able to come back to the, the council and the latter part of this year, or certainly the first part of next year, uh, with, with some recommendations uh, for the council to consider. And obviously, this has been involved the states and for the, the states involved in the council to consider as well. So, uh, are there any any questions or comments? You can raise your hand and we'll call on you. All right, don't see any. Did we ever solve Chester's communication problem? Do we know? I don't have confirmation just yet, uh, but still trying to work okay. with them on that. All right, well, hopefully, uh, as John said, hopefully you can hear us. All right, so our next agenda item is a presentation on a reporting process used by the Mid-Atlantic Council for Recreational Tilefish Harvest. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Carson with us this morning to uh, uh, give us a briefing on that. So Carson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to remember to say next slide whenever I need to. But um, I'm really happy to be here today, and I'm excited to listen in on the discussions as well as giving this presentation. Um, and this presentation is focusing on private angler reporting for tile fish that are managed by the Mid-Atlantic region. And I'm actually not the tile fish lead on this project. Um, that's Matt Seeley, but he was unavailable today. But I'm the lead on electronic technologies for Mid-Atlantic Council staff. So some of you may know me from being at um, the South Atlantic Council and ACCSP um, citizen science at work groups and things like that. So um, I'm just excited about the different solutions we can come up with. But um, you can go ahead to the next slide. And I'll dive right in. So first I wanted to touch on kind of the need for private angler uh, reporting um, for tilefish. So basically this is a um, very data poor and, but it appears that the harvest of golden and blue line tilefish has been increasing in recreational and commercial fisheries for several years. And these species are an important recreational fishery for certain communities and ports. But the fishery occurs um, very far offshore and relatively few anglers are um, partaking in the recreational fishery. Um, and because of that, very few anglers, tilefish anglers are intercepted by Emirates. Um, For example, we know from stakeholders that there is some private angler fishing happening in New Jersey and New York. Um, however, often there are no MRIP estimates for those states. So, um, the the few data for private anglers exists and the recreational bag limits are actually set using an estimation methodology that uses for higher BCR data to estimate private angler landings. Um, so a reporting mechanism using the EBCR structure already in place for commercial and for higher fisheries was thought to be um, the best way to improve private recreational data. Um, and hopefully improving stock assessments, including the blue line tilefish stock assessment, which is um, very data poor. And then, you know, allow us to set more appropriate fishing regulations in the future. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. So I'll just get into some of these reporting requirements. So who is required to report these Regulations apply to recreational vessels that are intending to fish for blue line or golden tilefish north of the North Carolina and Virginia border. So this would, <clears throat> excuse me, include um, a for hire vessel that was planning to take a private recreational fishing trip as well. And tilefish permits, um, private angler permits are issued to the vessel owner 
and each vessel used for fishing or catching tilefish must be permitted. So, but if you're on board a vessel issued the tilefish permit, you don't need another individual permit. So it's not like an individual fishing license. And then each vessel may carry as many individuals as the vessel is rated to carry, and then all may fish for tilefish under that single vessel permit. Um, but the bag limit for tilefish is per angler, not per vessel. And then under this permit, retained fish um, may only be kept for personal consumption. And then I just wanted to note that there are no fees uh, for the permits or for the reporting apps that are required. So next slide, please. Um, so these are the data fields that anglers need to report for any trip where tilefish are targeted or retained. And then these trips need to be reported within 24 hours of returning to port. So if you kind of look down this list, it's very similar to the fields that are required for our for higher uh, VTRs. All right, next slide, please. So these requirements were um, actually approved by the council in 2017, but implementation was delayed until 2020. So they went into place on August 17th last year, um, which was actually three months after the season had begun in May. Um, and then just getting into how the anglers report, they need to use an approved EVTR system um, but these are private anglers, so some, several of them are probably going from no reporting or little reporting to reporting a lot of information. So um, we worked with Harbor Light Software to create a new app called EFIN Logbook. And so this app was designed by anglers for anglers. Um, and thus far, this app is currently only for recreational tilefish reporting. Um, however, it may be expanded in the future. And um, anglers can also use Fish Online or eTrips Mobile, for example, if they're already a uh, for hire captain that is used to filling out those um, EBTRs. All right, next slide, please. So these are just four screenshots from a phone um, using the eFin mobile app. And if you kind of just go start, starting from the left, it's the sailing information. And then the next um, view is fishing information, catch reporting, and then uh, landing and submitting the trip. And um, these have some, some of these fields will autofill. And then for the map, you can um, kind of select a spot on a map and drop a pin in order to show your location. All right, next slide. All right, so in terms of implementation, um, the council held and recorded a webinar that provided a demo of the, of the EFIN app. And then we also keep a frequently asked questions document on the webpage and try to update that anytime something changes, um, say a new app got approved or something like that. And then the port agents um, are really helpful on the ground as, as they have been with other EBTR implementation. Um, and then Garfo produced um, flyers and rat cards and distributed them. So I'll show those on the next couple slides. And then as I mentioned, these requirements went live in August of last year. And there are only a few months left of the season, um, which ended on October 31st. So in 2020, there were 340 permits. Um, applied for, and then eight recreational trips were taken, and 84 fish were caught. Um, so we don't have a lot to compare this to, to say if these numbers are low or high, uh, but, but we have thought about the fact that there could have been less offshore effort um, during the pandemic, or there could have been low reporting due to this being a very new regulation. Um, so we're really interested in seeing what happens this year. And so the season opened just at the beginning of this month on May 1st. And then there was a notice of, a, of the tuna closure on May 4th. So um, oftentimes tilefish are, uh, private anglers are fishing for tilefish when they're also fishing for tuna. So there might be um, 
kind of not as much effort as there would have been. But we we do plan on getting a detailed report at the October Mid Atlantic Council meeting um, coming from Garfo and what data has been collected thus far. Next slide, please. So this is the flyer that was printed and distributed electronically by NOAA Fisheries. It has those um, QR codes in the corner so you can get to the permitting page and apply for that permit. And then next slide. So this one is the is the rack car that could be in um, bait and tackle shops and things like that. Once again, having those those QR codes that link to the permitting and the reporting pages. And then next slide. So um, just want to get into some next steps. Um, as you guys have probably gathered, this is a pretty new program. Um, we're, we're looking forward to that kind of more thorough review at our October Council meeting. And so with that report, we want to look more specifically at the number of permits that were issued, what we saw with how private angler tilefish catch and landings um, efforts, and what, what reporting issues might have been, um, what might have occurred, and then whether we need to do more outreach, um, and then that can kind of inform compliance and we'll, we'll talk to the port agents and see what they're seeing out there. There have been some stakeholders that are frustrated with these requirements and, and they don't want, want to report, <laughs> have to report their catch. Um, some folks don't want to report their location as we've seen with other reporting apps and requirements. Um, but I also wanted to note that um, there's potential for some app expansion. So uh, Ethan app, there might be more features that can incentivize the reporting and the use of the app, and it can bring more value to the angler and make it kind of a more useful tool for them. Um, and then overall, um, we think that gathering this basic information will help us have a better understanding of the scale of the fishery and participants and fill in some of those uh, big data gaps so that we're not using for higher EBTR information to set um, private angler reporting or private angler regulations. Um, next slide, please. So that's all I have, but I'm happy to take questions. And if there are things I can't answer right now, I'm happy to ask our tilefish folks and send some answers to John to distribute to the group after the meeting. And that's it. Thanks, Carson. That's an uh, interesting presentation, uh, interesting approach. Uh, I mean, anytime you start something new, obviously there's a there's a learning curve in the fishing community. And uh, so, uh, any questions uh, for Carson? Just uh, feel raise your hand. We'll call on you yeah. as we see the hands raised. Yes, but we have some. We're getting them up. Um, Got Jessica up first, looks like. All right, go ahead, Jessica. Thank you, Spud, and thank you for that presentation. So I might have found the answer to my question. Um, VTR, I guess that's vessel trip reporting. And then I see on the little rack card in the presentation that there's, I see in some spots you call it EVTR, sometimes just VTR. Is that just your general for hire reporting? Is it something more than that? I'm just not understanding. And that kind of threw me off. I hadn't heard that acronym before. It kind of threw me off um, in the presentation. Could you explain this a little bit more, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, VTR is vessel trip report. And then EVTR is electronic vessel trip report. And um, I think that this has to do with um, kind of how Garfo organizes their website and they're, they're calling all of these electronic reporting, um, no matter the sector, whether it's commercial for hire. And now this is, a, this is Garfo's only private angler reporting. They're calling it all EBTR on their website. So we, um, at the mid, I think we kind of followed suit. So we have an EBTR web page and then on that we have information for those three different kind of sectors that 
that have some electronic reporting requirements. So even though those requirements differ, they're all kind of called EBCR. Um, and so I, I think it, that could be confusing for a private angler, um, but, and, you know, I hadn't thought about a new region calling it, calling it something different, but that, that's what it generally means. Thank you. All right, uh, Mel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, thanks, Carson. That was interesting. And it's a, uh, you know, it's something we've been talking about. We've kind of thrown uh, in South Atlantic, we've kind of talked all about this type of thing, particularly for rare event species. So it, it seems like a tool that, you know, has some utility. And uh, one of the big struggles that we would run into in talking about something like this, and I know uh, Garfo is Garfo and Ciro is Ciro, but it was the, um, you know, you mentioned that there's no fee associated with it. And I know um, it, it does take, you know, time and money and effort to do this. So I, from a standpoint of cost, do you have, well, in, any concept? Obviously, Garfo felt they could handle it in terms of issuing the permits. Um, and it may be that it's, you know, it's one species and it's one, I'll say a relatively small scale. I don't have to issue 300 permits or so, you know, in our area for some of our rare event species um, might be a, might be three times that or five times that or something. So, but that, I was just kind of interested in the cost aspect because that's been kind of a, a barrier we've seen in the past in discussing things like this uh, in our region is just a, um, I guess, concern about bringing on something that uh, kind of an unfunded <laughs> mandate, if you will, from the, the council. And uh, uh, so just that's what I was curious mm -hmm. about is cost, if, if you know anything about that at all, or I just apparently Garfo felt they can handle it or they wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, that that is um, a great question. So, I mean, one thing that has happened is that the Mid-Atlantic Council has been interested in electronic reporting for a long time for various fisheries. Um, and I, I think there have been times where our feedback from Garfo is that, is that the resources aren't there right now to kind of implement something like that. And so, you know, this did get approved in 2017 and, and had delayed implementation in 2020. And some of it was getting those um, kind of free apps in place. And what happened is um, kind of getting back to this blanket EBTR word, um, Garfo was recommending their, their fish online app uh, that EV, that uh, for hire captains use already for the private angler reporting. And then some feedback that we got from fishermen was that that's fine for someone who knows about reporting already and maybe has seen a paper VTR or um, under uh, kind of is more used to those kinds of things. And but a private angler is going from, you know, maybe buying a fishing license or there a lot less reporting. So the the Mid-Atlantic Council actually funded um, the initial uh, production of the Ethan Logbook app with working with Harbor Light Software, who designed um, eTrips Mobile with ACCSP. So I think um, it did take some time and stuff did have to come together in terms of funds and availability of staff. Um, but like you said, it is a small amount of permit holders um, and using inf infrastructure that I think was, is in place by now. So I hope that helps. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Jeff White. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Carson, for the presentation. I think a um, couple questions on some of the permits and indicators of scale. I, 2020 was certainly probably the most challenging timing to put out a new program and with with the fishing activity being unusual 
Um, but with the kind of the eight trips reported last year uh, and the beginning of the season this year, do you have any other indicators of actual fishing activity aligning with the number of trips reported? Um, you know, is that kind of what you expected in this growth phase or um, is that just kind of something that you'll be addressing with, with outreach? Um, I think, I think potentially with something we would be addressing with outreach and also something that we would be addressing with a, maybe like another year or maybe two years worth of data to just kind of take a look at, at what comparisons we can make with, with, you know, kind of the, the limited information we do have from MRIP and uh, what for captains have told us and stakeholders have told us um, about what they see on the water. I think that's what we would be basing those comparisons on. So um, it will be probably kind of a slow, um, some slow progress in, in really evaluating the success of the program. Okay, thank you. And, you know, my other question was kind of looking at the 340 permits, you know, signed up from last year, that number was higher than some of the initial estimates of how many people you thought might get the permit. And this group had a presentation from, from Florida before about uh, the state refish survey and the question of oversubscription. So is, is, are there thoughts by you or others about, you know, that free permit being, having kind of that oversubscription people saying, yeah, I might do it. So I'll grab it. Um, and, and is that a problem or a benefit when it comes to outreach? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think, when we look at a lot of our fisheries where it's very easy to get a permit, you do have that instance of kind of waiting permit holders or getting the permit just to have it. And maybe you don't plan on, on fishing that specific permit. So I think we would just need to be careful how we're interpreting the number, but I, I don't see it as necessarily a bad thing as long as, as we're aware of that. Um, instance, and we would look more at the the trips taken and the the catch information um, for for looking at kind of trends in the fishery. Sounds good, and thanks to the committee for indulging my extra question in there over my hand. <laughs> that's quite all right, Jeff. That's that's what we're here for. All right, Luis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody, and. Thank you, Carson, for the presentation. Very helpful and informative. Uh, I am trying to uh, to get an idea of, you know, if you, if you can give us some background on, on the development of this program, how much coordination you had with the MRIP program and ACCSP. You know, as the program is being thought about and developed, I'm thinking about, you know, where the data is going to go, is collected here, and then how it's going to be used and integrated with the actual estimates for tile fish. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, a lot of the program developed um, before my time, and I'm not exactly sure how all those conversations went at the council level and then at the GARPO level um, when it came to implementation. But I do know that the data um, is going into ACCSP and GARPO's VTR databases. So um, the VTR data it, it will be very comparable to how we have for higher VTR data in the mid-Atlantic, and we also have for higher um, MRIP estimate. So we kind of have both. And um, and once I think I think with this specific program, what it's going to look like is evaluating what information we are getting and seeing whether that can be 
um, useful to MRIP and, and whatever comparisons can be made across the two data sets. And I think that's kind of similar to what, what happens with for higher, although I think there is some integration of the um, for higher ABTR data into um, some MRIP estimates. So I think an MRIP person can probably uh, speak to that a little better than, than I can, but that's what I know so far. Okay, thank you, Carson. This helps a lot. All right, uh, Jeff, did you want to respond to that? I'll let you jump ahead if that's what you raise your hand for. Uh, thank you. It's just a, a minor clarification on the data flow. So the eFIN application goes directly to GARFO only. The parts that come to both GARFO and ACCSP are either the safest eTrips commercial and four hire trips or the, the GARFO fish online uh, commercial and four hire trips. So the, the part of that that ACCSP is involved in are the are the commercial and poor hire, not the the EFIN private angler, and um, you know we were to answer Luis a little bit. The ACSP was kind of consulted early in that process of angler apps, and we just weren't able to develop something um, on a timeline that was as streamlined uh, as as the anglers were wanting, and so that was um, that was why the development with with Harbor Light ended up that way. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. All right, uh, Chester. Yes, can you hear me now? I got you loud and clear. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to see if this would work. I, I'm on an Android phone, and sometimes these different operating systems don't play too well together, but I've learned that if I put this phone in landscape as opposed to portrait, the symbol for unmute comes up. So problem has been solved. Thank you. All right, we, we got you loud and clear. Thank you, Chester. All right, uh, Mike Larkin, go ahead. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Okay, I was insecure then. I'm talking to myself. But anyway, so um, yeah, my question about it, well, first of all, I think it's a great presentation. I think it's a uh, a great way to deal with those um, rarely intercepted species. But my question is more about um, compliance and um, enforcement. So what do you think, I, I know you just started the program, you don't wanna um, you know, jump down the anger's throat, but what do you, so if I understand correctly, they have within 24 hours to report the fish. So like if they get intercepted at the dock, um, there won't be, um, they could, you know, um, it's like they, law enforcement could um, enforce that they report their catch through the program because they still could do it after the fact. Um, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to ask your thoughts on ways to increase enforcement and I mean, increase compliance through an enforcement there. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that what is going to be important is a lot of outreach and then I mean maybe not the specific trip it might be hard to enforce that specific trip but just making sure that vessel is permitted for um, mm -hmm. the for the private angler fishing especially um, if you know it's a for hire trip coming it's a for hire boat coming back that says they were on a private trip well do you have that permit so I mean there's some enforcement that can happen um, and you know I think the other piece there is is just as much outreach as possible and um the idea of making these apps kind of a tool that fishermen want to use i think that's you know going to be one of the most important ways of keeping people involved gotcha do you ever think you would change it so they would um have to do it before they offload do you think it's too much of a burden or like they'd have to report the catch before they remove the fish from the cooler, remove from the boat, or maybe that'd be yeah. too much. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because we do have that requirement on for higher trips and, and commercial trips yeah. where it needs to be filled out as much as possible before hitting the dock. And um, I think that it might have to just come from what issues we might be seeing out there. So I think there needs to be some conversations with 
enforcement and, and what they're seeing after we get that report, oh, yeah. after we, we just see things in place for a little while. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Well, that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I want to jump down to Fran. I think she can maybe give us some useful background and um, context for how, how things were developed, and then I'll come back to you, Beth. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to kind of fill in some of the, the holes here. What we did is we tried to we tried to get a scaled down version um, of the current apps that are out there so that the, like Carson said, the people who weren't used to doing EVTR reporting would have something uh, easy to use. We put together a working group of um, captains who do tile fish and uh, they kind of gave us feedback and that's how we built the app. We self-funded the app um, and then what we did is our plan is we use that app to jumpstart another program under NIFWIF um, with the state of Rhode Island and the Saltwater Angler Association in Rhode Island. Um, what we're going to do with that is continue to get feedback from the users to add in those bells and whistles that will make them use the app more, such as tide, weather, lunar data, are kind of the top things that are coming out of, of that project. And our plan is to take that and move that into the, the EFIN platform so that we can kind of get better buy-in to use the app from the, the current fishermen that are, um, that are using it. Our analytics, we have analytics on, on the users of the program. In 2020, we show 62 successfully uploaded trips. The, uh, and that spanned geographically from North Carolina to Maine, with the most popular ports being Barrington, Rhode Island did nine trips, Mastic, New York did seven, and Virginia Beach did six. Those were our top three um, ports uh, for, for uploading data. Um, our hope is, our feedback has been that the people that do tilefish also do tuna, and they would like to do both under one app. Currently, right now, if they do catch the tuna, they have to go and report that under HMS. Um, so our long-term goal would be to send the data to the ACCSP. As Jeff mentioned, currently, right now, it goes to GARFO. Um, we feel that if we send it to the ACCSP, then we'll be able to leverage their ability to include HMS data. So um, our long-term goal is to improve on the app. So this year we're going to continue working on our analytics of the app so we can understand um, you know, how the captains are using that and you know, different things that we can put into the app to, to get them to continue using it and to, um, to get understanding of, of how they, they use it. Um, and our goal is to continue working on the app and if other species uh, are mandated, um, we'll put those into the app. Currently, right now, as you saw on the screenshots, it's just the, the golden tile fish and the blue line tile fish, which makes it easy and, and slim down. But uh, we did build it so that we can add in other species quickly. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Fran. That's, that's very helpful. So, all right, Beth, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, so I wanted to circle back to uh, the the discussion that Mike Larkin kind of started about compliance um, and enforcement. So if, if I'm assuming that since the council made this a mandatory reporting requirement, the goal was to get a complete census of tile fish that were being landed. But if you were to uh, measure compliance and find that that was a, an issue, and that your outreach was only going so far, uh, what plans do you have to account for that in your estimates that come from this app? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not really sure what would be addressed if we found there was a big gap in um, the amount of compliance we were seeing and, and I know that that's that can be hard to estimate in and of itself um, 
I, I think that you know, we're gonna do the best we can and, and talk about with uh, enforcement and um, folks on the water as much as we can to get a sense of that. But um, I think the key for us here is that we have, we're really like working with very little information at all. So even if we don't have 100% compliance, um, we're, we're still getting more information than we had before. Um, and, and hopefully we can use uh, private angler VTR data instead of for higher VTR data for our um, looking at our private recreational um, set of anglers. But, but I mean, I agree that that definitely is going to be a concern and something we have to address down the line. So is the goal to get an actual estimate or is the goal right now just to learn more about the fishery and where they're operating? I guess I'm not clear on what, what the expected outcome is. Yeah, I mean, my understanding of, the, of this project is to um, get a census, but um, kind of understanding that it, it might not be um, kind of, it, it would be very hard to validate. Um, so I think it will take several years of information collection to get a feel for um, whether it is a full census. I don't think it would be treated as a, as a full census in the first couple of years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I can try to get more information on that from the top fish folks as well. Okay, uh, John Foster. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I uh, sort of two questions. One was a follow on or, or very similar to Bev's and it was just, was there, a, you know, uh, thoughts or discussions on the need for some sort of um, sort of more formal validation sampling to account for any under coverage or under reporting. Sounds like there's there's been thoughts along those lines or discussions, but it's it's sort of undetermined at this point. Uh, and my second question, uh, which uh, could be either for for Carson or maybe Fran, was um, you know there were you provided some information on the number of trips that were reported and sort of where those reports were coming in. I'm curious as to how many individual captains or, or app accounts um, those reports sort of represent? Was it, you know, a, a small number of, of captains reporting the majority of those trips, or was it, um, you know, uh, a larger number of captains reporting, you know, a few, a variable number of trips each? I'm just curious about sort of the distribution of users and, and trip reports. Thank you. I'll, I'll handle that as best I can um, from our analytics. And again, it's, you know, our analytics and, and I'm not sure what Garfo has on their end, but uh, in 2020, we show the law, uh, the app being launched 253 times by 139 separate users. Uh, most of the users were running iOS. We had 93 on iOS and Android had 46. Um, and, and that was over 139 users. So that's that's what we show on, on our end. Okay. Yeah, and I think when we're working with these, oh, go ahead. So, so yeah, yeah that's awesome. uh, I was just gonna say that, that, you know, depending on how, um, few users there are and, and what the information looks like. We, we will need to, when we're doing these final reports or these annual reports, we'll need to be careful of the confidentiality um, of the data as well. But I just wanted to note that. Okay, if I, so just this John again, if I could ask just a quick follow up. So is there no information on sort of not identifying the, the individual specific users but sort of how many what what how to distribute the trips among the the individual captains i mean how many i'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of how many captains 
actually reported the trips as opposed to, you know, um, uh, captains that may have downloaded the app um, by various operating system. I'm just curious as to how many actual captains, you know, accounted for the trips that were reported. And if there's no information on that, that's fine. I was just, that, but that's what I was curious about. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, well, so what we're looking at for last year is only eight trips, and, and I'm not sure if that was all one captain or eight different captains. Um, but I think that we would be planning to dig into that when we look at the 2021 kind of completed season, for sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dee, go ahead. So, based on the response given to Bev about the validation um, before these numbers would be acceptable, I think in general, not so much about this this presentation, but in general for the work group is what is the goal of the work group as far as doing a census level data collection program versus MRIP and how long will it take to, for, I would assume MRIP is going to have to certify anything that the, the Southeast wants to do um, and how long that will take. I think we talked some about that in the last meeting, but um, you, you know, this, this work group is it, the outcome of, of the presentations, this work is spilling over into some state related stuff and fishermen are starting to really want census data versus MRIP and they I get the sense from fishermen that as soon as we do some sort of implement an app for a census level type of reporting they're going to expect those numbers to be used immediately and and and, and if they're not they'll you lose faith in both programs a census related a census data collection and or MRIP I just that is something I feel like the work group eventually needs to address and have some understanding um, and how to talk to fishermen about that because they seem to lose faith in these programs when they're number when they're providing data and they're not being used. So it's not a question. I had I had the same question Bev had, but it got answered. But that this is my follow up thoughts for the work group in general. So I don't know if all that yeah, makes thanks, sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's what we all struggle with. In a perfect world, we would all like to have census level data on all fishing activities, and uh, whether that's realistic to expect, uh, I think it's something we all have to keep our feet on the ground about. And you know, we you know, it's uh, one thing to have a, a very specialized fishery like tilefish with a, you know, maybe a three digit level of participants, but we, you know, we move into snapper grouper and depending on whether we focus on a few species in the complex or the entire complex, now we're talking about thousands of, of people. And, uh, you know, I think the one thing that, that certainly comes out of this presentation is that, you know, fish, recreational fishermen are used to permits and licenses. What they're not used to is trip level reporting uh, other than when they might be intercepted, you know, at a, at a boat ramp or a or another access point and through a mail survey. So that's that's a big that's a big lift for a lot of fishermen is to go, you know, for okay, I'll get a I'll get a permit that allows me to do this activity for a prescribed period of time to now I'll, you know get on an app or get on my computer and report. So that's that's all stuff we're gonna have to struggle with, but it's certainly relevant to you and that's what we're here for. So well, for everybody I, I in the work group. Yeah, I think it needs to be, be noted that whatever, if we do have a recommendation at the end of all this, that 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 we need to have reasonable expectations from both fisheries managers and the public as what you will get out of this the first year in five years and in 10 years or something like that. Um, we're getting a lot of pressure to have everybody report flounder and they want this done by, you know, this year, everybody's going to report flounder. And it's like, there's no way. And the numbers won't, will be meaningless because right now MRIP will still be the number we will use. So, um, so this is bridging over into some state managed species too, but I, I, I feel like we can get there, but I think we have to, everybody, all the stakeholders, regardless of what seat you're in, 
need to have a reasonable expectation, uh, and that needs to be built into whatever we we develop and roll out, and and really communicate that is what I think we, you know, that would be a recommendation. I I think we we may want to consider as a work group later on. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Louise, and then I'm going to go back to Carson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is just a, a quick question for uh, John Foster. I, I think I know the answer to this question, but just to confirm, John, uh, it, it looks like from the way that this program was described, you know, you, you know going back to my first question to Carson, uh, but the nature of your questions to her as well, giving the impression that uh, this program was not developed in full coordination with the EMRIA program. Is that correct? It, Ms. John, so uh, I think that's a fair summarization, Louise. You know, certainly we were aware on it, uh, aware of it, but um, we didn't, you know, have an active role in its in its development. Right, and, and I'm thinking, John, in terms of, you know, and, and Dee mentioned this, that uh, the issue of eventually, you know, this potentially going for, you know, MRIP certification, or how, how are this data to be integrated into the estimates, right, that are going to be used for, for assessment and management? Uh, you know, so no longer a question, but more of a comment that, I, I think a lesson learned here, you know, that hopefully our working group is trying to address from the get-go is to have you guys involved, right, in helping us identify all those issues, right, with the data, the development and structure of the program in a way that the data is fully integratable with the existing estimates and data streams. Yeah, and I guess just to, to speak quickly to that, you know, um, you know, certainly the use of, of any data in assessment or management is beyond, you know, the scope of MRIP. Those are for other uh, entities with those authorities to, to decide on. Um, I would say, in, in specifically in terms of MRIP certification, uh, again, I'm not aware of any request for certification for, uh, for, for the Talfish reporting program. I would comment, I suppose it's, um, you know, it's it's without a validation component of some kind or, or some way to assess and and, um, and if needed, potentially correct for any, any under-reporting or, or inaccurate reporting, whichever direction it might go. Um, you know, that would be something that, that would be a kind of a key question for any certification. Um, you know, effort if it were to to ever move forward, you know, be requested or move forward. So um, it's not to say that something a, a census type program couldn't be certified without a validation component, but there would need to be you know you know sufficient justification for why that sort of component wouldn't be needed. And there may be ways to do that. Again, this is all sort of speculative, but um, but certainly that would be an important consideration. Thank you. That's good discussion, and I, you know, I think this goes back to what what Dee was saying is that you know we we as managers have expectations, the fishing community has expectations, and oftentimes I think when you uh, develop and implement a a new catch and effort survey, uh, oftentimes the expectation, especially in the fishing community and, and to some degree in the management community, is that it becomes an instead of and and not in in addition to MRIP. And I think that's one of the one of the challenges that we, we will always face. Uh, we certainly know what's going on in the Gulf with, with Red Snapper and we're all watching that and learning from it. And uh, there's a lot of angst and pain that goes on when expectations are not met. Um, so that's you know one of the goals of this work group is to make sure that we do have our expectations grounded in, in reality and whatever we end up recommending. Uh, it, it's clearly understood uh, what the result of that will be. So, uh, so it's good stuff. So, Carson, uh, go ahead. 
Um, yeah, I, I put my hand back down because I think everyone who spoke before me kind of covered what I had in mind, but I was just going to highlight the fact that um, how unique this fishery is and that it's offshore. There, It's not a lot of, you know, state versus federal and shore mode and um, issues in, in that sense. So I think it is kind of this unique um, ability to implement something like this and and you know we don't know how successful it is yet but in terms of of what we're currently using for management i think it will be an improvement and then um generally when we think about other rec issues that we have in our region our conversations look a lot like the ones you are having where how can we require something like private angler reporting without um being able to deliver exactly what the stakeholder who's reporting wants out of it and how do we manage those expectations and how do we validate it so i just wanted to point those things out but this um this conversation is, is super interesting and helpful from our perspective as well all right thanks carson okay last call for any questions for carson I don't see any hands up um Carson, thanks very much for, for being with us. Uh, certainly the presentation stimulated a lot of good discussion, a lot of good questions, get to the heart of what we're what we're challenged with here. And we, we certainly appreciate you being with us. So uh, thanks very much. All right, we'll move on to our next presentation. And that's gonna be with uh, Jackie Wilson. And she's gonna talk to us about NIMPS HMS Recreational Report. So I'll turn it over to you, Jackie. Hi there. I, I think that's actually John Foster's presentation that I'm seeing. Oh, I've got you. Yeah, I think I got my presentations confused. Let me bring that one up. Okay. Let's see. LPS I definitely survey. couldn't speak to that one very intelligently, so I'll leave that to John. Uh -huh. There you go. There we go. Yeah. I think we're there. Okay. Take it away, Jackie. Thank you. Okay. So good morning. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you all. My name is Jackie Wilson. I work with the Atlantic High Migratory Species Management Division. Um, I usually wear a commercial hat, but uh, today I'm going to be talking with you about our what we call recreational reporting, which is basically private angler reporting. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about our for hire or charter head boat permits, because they have a little additional um, angle to them um, than what you see in the other for hire sectors. And, um, but today I'm just gonna go over what we, what we require for our permits, um, as well as our reporting and kind of how it dovetails into some of these other topics that are being addressed this morning, both with the tile fish and then John Foster obviously will be giving much more information on the large pelagic survey. So next slide, please. So just to, to back up to make sure we're all um, in the same place, I wanted to, to kind of highlight what I really mean by Atlantic highly migratory species. So we're a little different in that we manage species that move. And so they go across council boundaries um, and we are managing things along the Atlantic seaboard, Gulf of Mexico, and in the U.S. Caribbean. So these are species like the big um, bluefin tuna, our other tunas, which are the bays tuna, big eye, albacore, yellowfin, and skipjack, uh, sharks, but this excludes spiny dogfish, uh, swordfish, and then our suite of billfish. So the blue and white marlin, sailfish, round scale, and long bill spearfish. And these species are managed by our division um, they are federally managed, and as I mentioned before, we go from Maine to Texas, including the U.S. Caribbean, and tunas are actually managed to shore uh, with just a few exceptions. So I wanted to highlight that our division is a bit unique. Uh, we're not actually part of a specific region or science center. We operate under the assistant administrator to NOAA Fisheries, um, so we are a little different. Uh, in 1976, the Magnuson Fisheries Conservation Management Act uh, was passed. In 1990, 
it was amended giving the authority to the Secretary of Commerce for Atlantic uh, HMS management. And then the secretarial authority was delegated to NOAA Fisheries, and in 1992, NOAA Fisheries created our division, the HMS Management Division. So given these fish, um, you know, move across the different council boundaries, um, and they also move across the Atlantic, we are also, uh, NOAA Fisheries also participates in various international fisheries organizations. And these include the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, um, also commonly known as ICAT. And I mention this because it's going to become important as to why we have some of these different permits and reporting requirements, because we have obligations to these international fishing uh, organizations in terms of our reporting. So ICAT in, in particular promotes the international cooperation and management of a number of these species, including the tunas and the billfish and some pelagic sharks. ICAT was established under the Atlantic Tunas Convention Act and the Atlantic HMS Management Division implements any of the binding recommendations that come out of ICAT uh, domestically through ATCA. So just a little background for those not as familiar with um, the HMS management and, and why it operates the way it does. Next slide, please. So the species I'm really gonna be highlighting this morning um, are the ones that are shown here. These require 24 hour uh, HMS recreational catch reporting for landing, as well as 24 hour reporting of dead discards of bluefin tuna. So the species that I'm gonna be focusing on are the bluefin tuna, swordfish, and our billfish. And when I talk about catch reporting, it'll become clear that I am focusing on not a full trip report. They're not reporting everything that they encounter on a trip. Um, it's just specifically these species um, that our reporting pertains to. So just kind of keep that, that in mind as well. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over a brief overview here of our HMS recreational permits. Um, all of these permits are vessel-based, so they're not issued to the individual. Um, they're open access, and they can be obtained online at the web page that I have shown here on the slide. It's pretty much self-service. They go in, uh, they log in, they enter in their vessel information and the other pertinent information. They can pay via credit card, and they can actually print out their own permit. Um, so it's something that is not done through one of the regional offices. The HMS permits that authorize our recreational fishing, again, this is kind of more the private angler fishing. Um, specifically, we have an Atlantic HMS angling permit. We also have an Atlantic HMS charter headboat. And when folks are not on a for hire trip, uh, the charter headboat permit can also authorize commercial retention of tunas and swordfish when they're combined with a commercial endorsement. So it has both a recreational and a commercial aspect to it, depending on how they're fishing on that trip. That's a little bit different than some of the other charter headboat or for hire permits out there. I do wanna mention that on that website, we also have some of our open access commercial permits. These are the Atlantic Tunas Harpoon, the Atlantic Tunas General Category, and the Swordfish General Commercial. We consider these our hand gear permits because they're not using things such as long line on these trips. They're using rod and reel um, harpoon, as is mentioned there. So they are they have a slightly different um, kind of flavor to them than our other commercial permits that you typically think of for HMS. So next slide, please. So now I wanna talk about our recreational reporting. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are a member of ICAT, and so we have binding um, recommendations. That means we are obligated to meet those that are agreed upon during those meetings. And part of those um, deal with the reporting uh, domestically within the U.S. fisheries, as well as we have in-season management for three different recreational HMS quotas. And so the first one is the Marlin uh, 250 fish count or annual catch limit. This comes out of ICAT and the US um, has to report on our 
Atlantic marlin landings. Um, this is blue and white marlin and round scale spearfish. Again, we're limited to 250 fish um, each year. So we have to be able to account for those landings uh, and report back to ICAT on those. We also have our regional bluefin tuna angling category um, quota management in the trophy category or are for the fish that are larger than the 73 inches curved fork length. Um, this is typically a commercial size fish, if you will, but anglers are allowed um, a certain number of these in a given year. Um, it's in this trophy category. We have three different sub quotas um, that are north, south, and Gulf of Mexico. So we're monitoring the quotas based on those reports that we're getting from those, um, those permits and their associated reporting in order to look at that in-season management of those quotas. Then we also have another quota for bluefin tuna angling category. Um, we have a school category, which is the 27 to less than 47 inches curve fork length. And then we have a large school, small medium category, which is the 47 to less than 73 inches. Um, and again, these sub quotas are managed in part by this reporting that's associated with those permits. We also use the large pelagic survey um, to monitor uh, landings from these different uh, permit types. The large pelagic survey, as, as John will go into in more detail in the next presentation, is kind of limited in its geographic scope and timing. It covers Maine to Virginia and then June through October. So we are using the LPS numbers um, as a primary data source but then we are using this HMS catch reporting that I just described to cover the times and the areas outside of that LPS coverage. Okay, next slide, please. So as I've uh, mentioned before, for the HMS angling and the charter headboat permits, we have a 24 hour um, reporting requirement. So the the anglers must report within 24 hours of a trip completion, um, and they have to report any bluefin tuna landings and dead discards, and then any landings of swordfish uh, in the billfish. And again, this is the white and blue marlin, sailfish, and round scale spearfish. So these reports are done within 24 hours. This 24 hours is primarily driven because if they are fishing under one of the commercial, the, the general category permit I mentioned earlier, the bluefin tuna in particular has to have a tag placed on that fish immediately upon offloading. And that is usually done, um, or is always done by the, the dealer who's actually buying that fish from the vessel. Those permit numbers have to be on that trip or on that report that's submitted. And so there's a 24 hour requirement there um, upon trip completion to allow time for that uh, fisherman to get the tag number and enter it on there. Those are not the recreational trips, just to be clear, because anything that's landed on a recreational trip can't be sold. Um, but that's primarily what's driving uh, that 24-hour uh, time frame. We do have a num number of reporting options that are available. Um, so the same website that I gave earlier, they can also go in and report their, their catch and their dead discards of bluefin tuna um, on an online uh, reporting uh, program. We do have an app that the uh, anglers can, can use, can be done from their phone. Um, there's a call-in number that can be used, and we have recently incorporated our data uh, elements in the safest e-trips, both the mobile and online version. And so now they can, um, anglers can go in if they have multiple permits and they can submit one report and meet those HMS requirements in addition to the other permits that they may hold. So we are working towards trying to streamline um, the reporting uh, for those anglers. Uh, we have been in touch with Fran about incorporating the tuna, um, and I can talk a little bit more on that based on questions if people are interested. But I will note one of the main, the main issues right now is that um, our data requirements, which I'll show in the, the next slide, they're more in depth than what is currently available in the Tilefish reporting app. And in part, that's because of the information that we need to collect in order to meet our domestic um, in-season monitoring as well as our international reporting requirements. So it would 
basically require more burden on the angler that's reporting if they want to be able to report both tilefish and tuna, for instance, in one application. But we are working with GARFO to incorporate these additional HMS elements in their EVTR. Again, that's that electronic vessel trip report. Uh, this includes the fish online reporting, and we are talking with Bluefin Data, which is the company that's uh, developed the program Vessel, so that's a vessel trip reporting. And we're working, um, willing to work with them if they want to incorporate incorporate those HMS elements as well in the near future. So next slide, please. So just to reiterate, we, um, we have also state reporting requirements. Um, some of the states, although most, most of these fish are caught uh, in federal waters, uh, but there are also uh, state, some states that have state reporting requirements, billfish and swordfish caught in Florida state waters. Um, they actually require that those anglers go to that HMS webpage app or phone to do the reporting, so they kind of backstop our regulations. And there is some alternative HMS catch reporting in Maryland and North Carolina. Um, those states require catch card reporting for the recreational bluefin tuna, billfish, and swordfish, and Maryland also requires sharks to be reported on those catch cards. Um, and we also have a requirement for HMS landed and HMS tournaments to be reported. Uh, they have to be reported by the tournament director. They're not reported by the individual anglers, um, but that is an additional uh, data stream that we have. And we have the ability to cross check to make sure we don't have duplicate reporting um, occurring. Next slide, please. So the HMS catch reporting, um, again, it's based on landings. It's not a full and complete trip report. It is uh, required within 24 hours of trip completion, and it's for the bluefin tuna, uh, landings and dead discards, um, as well as landings of swordfish and billfish. Some of those additional elements that I was alluding to earlier deal with a length and weight of each fish. But as, uh, for instance, dead discards aren't landed, uh, we do ask questions on whether or not the length and weight were measured or estimated. Um, that helps us if we have an estimate of, of a weight, we um, uh, know we can perhaps rely more on a length estimate versus a weight estimate, and then we can do conversions so we can get to a weight so we can then um, apply things to the appropriate quota. We do ask questions about whether um, a fish was dressed or whole, um, whether it was entered in an HMS tournament. Again, so we have, have ways of uh, taking out du potential duplication. We ask questions on hook and fight time as well as fishing method and hook type. So, and as I mentioned earlier, if something, if a bluefin tuna was harvested and commercially sold, it also has to have an individual tag placed and the tag number has to be on that report as well, but that is not applicable to recreational anglers. So next slide, please. So again, I'm Jackie Wilson. Um, I work a lot in our electronic data, um, usually within the commercial realm, but um, I have been working a lot with the eTrips and ACCSP and the other parties. I have been involved in the Citizen Science app as well, which were um, a fascinating group of, of workshops. Uh, Clifford Hutt is also the HMS Recreational Coordinator as well as Brian McHale, but I have Cliff's email there as well in case people are interested and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you again. Thanks, Jackie. All right, uh, questions for Jackie. Just, uh, if you raise your hand, we'll we'll get you in order. You got any hands? Yep, they're you coming. Okay, we got a few going up, so we'll get them entered. All right, we'll start off with you, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry, can you, can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> I couldn't, all right, sorry, so um, yeah. the question about the um, flight time. So these are dead fish that dock, and I always think of like, flight time is accorded because it could relate to survivorship. So I'm curious, why do you guys ask for, for flight time? 
So this is actually one of the questions our Science Center has asked um, down in the Southeast Fisheries Science Center for more information on fight time and gear um, that are used. So it was basically related uh, to uh, what they're asking for us. Science Center asked. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, La Louise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jackie, for the, for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious about how how this different types of data, you know, data that are coming in through these different reporting uh, programs, where right? you have different types of uh, data cards, right, and then we're going to get a presentation from John as well on the LPS, which covers some of these species. Uh, how are these data integrated? I mean, what is the like the bottom of the funnel, right? I mean, how do they figure into an estimate for a species in you know, a certain sector of the fishery, say private recreational versus for hire? You know, if we're trying to find out for that sector, you know, the total landings and discards for this species, how how does that get all integrated? Thanks. Right. So, well, first, we only ask for information on discards for bluefin tuna. Um, but when they are reporting in our HMS um, app or online, they're reporting on their, under their particular permit. So we know whether that's an angling permit or a charter head boat permit. So we have that different sector right there. So I can speak to that for um, the HMS reporting. The same thing comes in on the e-trips. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the same thing, there's different trip types um, that are in the e-trips reporting and then we also have the vessel information that we can cross-reference and tie to a permit so then we also can can know exactly what type of of trip um is reporting there though quite honestly our, most of our our angling permits are probably going to the hms um specific programs to report they're probably not using e-trips as much um, in terms of LPS, I'll leave that to to John to speak to because I don't know I don't know exactly how um, the data is being collected there and how they can determine to sector um, the catch card information. My understanding, I again I I don't know particularly if we can tie it to a to a permit to know the different sectors, but I know we do use the catch card information in order to um, provide those numbers in particular to like our ICAT stuff as necessary. So. Thank you, Jackie. Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow-up to, to John then, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Louise. John, and you, you may cover this on, on your presentation. Uh, Jackie, explain, you know, how the different data streams come to the right bin, so to speak, you know, by sector there, fishing mode. But um, you know, if I'm trying to find out, you know, what's the total landings in or discards for a certain species, you know, one of these large migratory uh, species, how, how, do, how do these different data sources get integrated into, is there a single estimate that comes out of this that integrates LPS, for example, collected data with this HMS, uh, you know, card data reporting program, or how does that end up uh, generating estimates at the end? Sure, Louise. So, and you know, I, I'll have to uh, speak a little bit for for HMS and Jackie. Please correct me if I'm I'm wrong. And, uh, and it's not something that we handle directly in in the Office of Science and Technology. But so specifically for the catch cards. And LPS because those programs are, are well, it, it, certainly in Maryland at least they're occurring uh, together. Um, you know, my understanding is that the catch cards uh, they're coming in. Uh, you know, we get sort of 
sometimes weekly or monthly reports from uh, you know from Maryland DNR, the, the state partner that, that does the actual operation side of of the, the catch card program there, and and in the same for North Carolina, um, and and HMS essentially the management division um, uses those streams sort of to monitor in season. Um, uh, progress of the fishery or, or activity in the fishery. Um, but we don't, uh, within s &T, we don't formally integrate the catch cards into uh, the estimates. They're, they're kept separate. Occasionally, we do, um, you know, compare estimates, uh, but there's no formal integration in that respect. Um, and that's true of, of the other, um, you know, as, as Jackie mentioned, Essentially, within the LPS coverage, uh, the LPS is the primary um, data source for estimates. Outside of, of LPS coverage, it would be you know, the other programs that exist. Uh, I will add, though, that um, there is a, an MRIP uh, regional implementation plan for Atlantic HMS, as there are for, for the other um, regions. And uh, this data integration. Um, is identified as as the sort of one of the top priorities. I believe it's number two, with the first, the highest priority being um, completion of of the LPS redesign. And I'll, I'll speak to that a bit uh, in my presentation. So it's definitely on the radar. Uh, it's it's work in progress, but you know, sort of the current state is using the LPS where the LPS exists uh, and using the other sources. Um, uh, where the LPS uh, does not exist, as a general statement. Okay, got it, John. Thank you. Very helpful. All right, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Excellent. Thank you, and Jackie. Thanks for the presentation and kind of your historical, your HMS historical, broad scope of looking at four higher reporting pathways and overall reporting pathways um, for this group you know hms has been doing this a lot longer than the previous conversation about about tilefish so what year did kind of this private recreational reports become mandatory just for a perspective yeah so we started that um issuing those permits and the reporting in 2000 so it's, it's been around for a little while Okay. Um, and then, you know, since this work group's really trying to, to find the, the silver bullet of how to capture more private angler information from reporting systems in other ways, um, you know, bluefin tuna, great big fish, hard to hide. You know, how do you guys, how do you guys measure your reporting compliance and kind of what do you expect your scale is on the on the private side the four higher you've got other ways to look at but um you know on the private side how do you how much how do where do you estimate the reporting compliance is right now after 21 years of a program yeah no that's a good question i don't have a number off the top of my head we do know that there is under reporting um the good thing is that we do have time periods like with lps for instance with where they overlap with our HMS catch reporting, if you will. So we have some kind of, of checks potentially that can occur there. Um, but in, in, in the commercial context, we actually have uh, dealer reports that we can um, do for the, the check on that compliance, if you will, and we do that all the time. Um, and those bluefin tuna tags, for instance, play a, a really important role in that. Um, on the on the recreational kind of private angler side of the house, um, there isn't as much uh, kind of dual data streams to do that crosswalk, if you will. Um, and so a lot of times there's a little of um, self-reporting on social media and other places, if you will, that kind of raise our attention to different things, especially when there's really big events of, you know, very large fish that are being reported. So things get checked up that way, but, um, I think the bottom line is we know we know there is underreporting, um, but we do tend to get a lot of attention when uh, 
you know, people are posting stuff and, and there is a, a violation where OLE goes out, that those make a big splash as well. So I don't know if, if that's the best way to characterize it, but that gets people's attention and, and helps them them report as well. So. Okay, I, I appreciate that. That's helpful. And kind of one more thing that um, just popped into my head. Hiv, has HMS looked at or, or considered the, uh, since you've got a HMS angling permit, um, and a way, I'm assuming, to contact those people has been there. Has been any investigation of kind of a follow-up mail survey or contact panel on people with permits and how many trips they took for bluefin that year, or how many they, you know, some some other methodology of following up. Is that been explored? Um. I don't know if in that particular context, no, I don't know. I do know like on the permits themselves that are issued, you know, we have the information specifically where they need to report, what they need to report. Um, we have our HMS listserv um, that goes out to folks have to sign up for that. You're not automatically signed up uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, and then we also have compliance guides and other things that go out, but I don't know that we've actually done that particular survey, Jeff, to, to look at that. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Thank you, Spud, and thank you, Jackie, for that presentation. I guess one of my questions is, now that um, I heard you say this is program has been in place since the year 2000, have you guys, done some type of evaluation on it that led you to make some changes or update this program through time, whether it was, oh, it looks like we have underreporting here, here's, here's a way we're going to do that, or we're going to change up the way that this program operates. Maybe we need to add additional mechanisms for people to do the reporting because it looked like you had a fair number of ways to do that, and it looked like some were added recently. I guess I was just wondering kind of like a feedback loop here, um, how you evaluated it, kind of what you were looking for, and then what changes you've made over time. Yeah, and I haven't been around for the whole history of this program. Brad McHale is probably the, the most knowledgeable one since he actually started it in 2000. But I can say we have done those periodic checks. We know underreporting is an issue. And in part, we know it's an issue because it is a standalone kind of stovepipe reporting mechanism. And so kind of more recently, um, we have been working very hard with ACCSP and other partners like Garfo in trying to integrate our requirements within those other programs so that when people um, are on uh, you know, a trip that might encounter uh, one of those species I mentioned earlier, that reporting can be done in one place and there is much better compliance and, and better data quality if they're reporting it only once um, and they don't have to go and report in multiple places. So kind of to your point, I think we found um, and are hoping that that integration within other existing programs to kind of streamline the reporting um, will help with that overall um, compliance and, and work on getting that under-reporting uh, to become less and less over time. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't have the specifics in terms of what those feedback loops are, but I could definitely ask Brad and get back to you if that's something you're particularly interested in. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? And. Uh... Well, folks have a chance to raise their hand. I got a couple of questions, Jackie. Uh, approximately how many permits are issued annually that are applicable to the private recreational sector? And is that number increasing, stable, declining? Do uh, you have any information on that? Yeah, so we have about 25,000 angler permits. They're, um, they're issued every year and they have been um, increasing over time, mainly as people have learned more and more about them. Um, we have about 3,500 charter headboat permits. Those are also a, an, a calendar year uh, issuance. Um, and my understand, understanding is that those have increased over time as well. Yeah, thank you. I know, I know that one of the things I believe that's affecting that too is that, you know, 
the, the private recreational sector now has uh, larger vessels and multiple engines and they're capable of reaching uh, grounds where these species are found more more than they probably ever have at least in in, in our generation's history so thank you any other any other questions all right don't see anything well thank you jackie that's very good uh, we appreciate you being with us and uh, and, uh it's helps us uh, get a better understanding of the universe of the sampling that's going on out there all right um next up uh john foster um we'll turn it over to you uh to talk about the large pelagics survey all right give me just a second as i make john a presenter john i've sent it over to you as a if you want to show your screen okay uh I believe I'm sharing my screen. Can everyone see the my window or just quick check on that? We're seeing the Google Slides. Yeah. Okay. And now it's just be the presentation view. That's correct. Okay, great. All right. Well, first again, as, as the other presenters said, thanks very much for, for uh, inviting uh, me and, and the opportunity to, to provide an update on the, the large pelagic survey or the LPS. Uh, this will be uh, a fairly high level overview uh, of the survey, um, particularly its design and estimation methods. And then uh, I'll also uh, have a slide at the end to, to give uh, sort of some quick information on, on the current redesign project for the LPS. Uh, and, and some of this I'll try to move through quickly. It was, uh, you know, Jackie had covered uh, different points of it. So, Again, primary purpose of the LPS is to provide catch and effort estimates uh, for Atlantic HMS and uh, select other large pelagic species for recreational fisheries uh, in the mid-Atlantic and, and uh, North Atlantic regions or New England regions. And again, we cover June through October. Uh, it's a, a, a complex design that uses a, a complemented surveys approach. So again, a, a it's similar in many ways to, to the more general MRIP surveys, uh, but it's specialized uh, for HMS. Um, and in particular, the, the current design and its coverage uh, uh, historically was, was based on uh, sort of the, the heart or the, the primary range of the Atlantic bluefin tuna fishery uh, along the Atlantic coast um, and associated other, other HMS fisheries. Uh, the data and the estimates are used in, in your standard suite of both assessment and management tasks. Um, Jackie had mentioned Atlantic Tuna's Convention Act that uh, this survey is performed at least in part under the authority uh, of that act. Uh, as she mentioned, there is a, there are permits that are required. They're vessel-based permits, uh, and as conditions of the permits, reporting is mandatory. Uh, and she also talked about the U.S. obligations in reporting to ICAT, uh, and I provided a link uh, to sort of more complete and detailed technical information on the design and estimation here. If that link isn't working in, in uh, the PDF that I sent, I'll, I'll be happy to send that link uh, as well. And this, again, will be provide much more complete and detailed technical information on the survey methods, uh, design and estimation methods. So again, as Jackie mentioned, uh, you know, there's sort of Three main HMS species groups, tuna, sharks, uh, and billfish swordfish. And then within the LPS, we cover a few other pelagics, dolphin, greater amberjack, and wahoo, for example. Uh, one additional specialization for bluefin, uh, Jackie mentioned the size classes that are used for management. Uh, all of the bluefin data collected through the LPS are also collected within size class. So we specifically ask for the catch information by size class for bluefin tuna only. For all the other species, it's more similar to, um, uh, to, to APIS uh, Access Point Angler Intercept Survey, uh, which is the more general uh, MRIP intercept survey. Uh, again, the coverage for LPS is private and charter boats uh, from Maine through Virginia. And temporarily, we cover June through October. And again, this corresponds to the, the primary spatial and temporal coverage of, of uh, the bluefin tuna fishery. One uh, additional bit of detail, we do not start sampling in New Hampshire and Maine until July. 
again, just based on historic trends and, and the fisheries. So I mentioned it's a complemented surveys design. Um, the LPS has subcomponent uh, programs. The Large Pelagic Telephone Survey, or LPTS, is our primary source of effort information, effort in terms of vessel trip units, not angler trips. And I'll speak in more detail about this in a minute. But this, the survey, there are actually separate surveys for private boat uh, and charter boat modes administered as, as separate components. Uh, and then there is the corresponding intercept survey, much like APIS. Uh, it's used primarily for catch rate uh, information as well as other detailed trip uh, characteristics. And then a third component to LPS is a biological sampling component uh, used for specimen collection, hard parts for age and growth work, uh, muscle tissue and gonads. Uh, a lot of this supports the um, ongoing sort of life history and population dynamics related research being done out of the Southeast Fishery Science Center. However, this sampling is opportunistic and uh, we do not use it uh, for the official catch and effort estimation. So it's a separate component. I, I won't speak much more to that in this, com in this uh, presentation. Okay, so turning to the LPTS, uh, starting with the private mode uh, survey. Again, its, its primary role is to estimate effort in terms of numbers, numbers of vessel trips for private boats. It's a list frame telephone survey where the sample frame is comprised of um, HMS vessel permits, specifically the angling category, uh, as well as the general uh, permit category. Uh, and as Jackie mentioned, uh, the angling the angling category is the sort of primary private recreational category, but the general category is also allowed to participate in HMS tournaments, a recreational activity, so that's why uh, it is included as well. Uh, reporting is mandatory, again, as required by the permit, and it is a stratified design, stratified by state and month, uh, and also two-week reference period. So. Again, captains uh, or the vessel operators are asked to report for a specific two-week period, the number of trips uh, that they have taken for LPS. Uh, they receive advance notification letters um, and um, the calling uh, to collect the data is done in the week immediately following uh, the two-week reference period. In terms of how the interviews are conducted, uh, it, again, it is interviewer administered using uh, computer assisted telephone interviewing or Katie. Uh, there are two other ways that uh, captains can report. There is a, a web based tool uh, with the information for how to, to access that provided in the advance notice letter. Uh, and, and in addition to the advance notice letter, the, the captains also receive a log sheet. And they can, if they choose, can fill out the log sheet and either mail or fax it, uh, that information in if they choose that, that option. 95% of, um, of the responses to the LPTS private come through the telephone mode. The, the other two modes are, are not used very frequently. Uh, in terms of the overall structure, it's a trip profile questionnaire. So we work backwards through time, uh, detailing each trip, starting with the most recent, and again, working sequentially back through time. Uh, there is detailed information collected for each trip, such as uh, fishing access site, um, where they returned at the end of their trip, uh, the primary target species, or again, in the, in the case of bluefin tuna, the primary size class, whether the trip was or was not part of an HMS tournament, uh, and then we actually collect some limited catch data through the phone as well. So it's limited to specific species. Um, and the driver for this uh, and, and, and much of the detailed information in both the LPTS and LPIS that I'll get to in a minute um, is to support uh, uh, indices of abundance that are calculated again uh, by assessment scientists at the Southeast Fishery Science Center and they use all of this information, again, to try to inform their models in, in generating the, the indices of abundance. Again, given that it's, it's fishery dependent data, uh, they are trying to, to correct for um, sort of those, those effects and, and, and yield indices of abundance that um, 
that as best they can are free of sort of the, the effects of being fishery dependent data. So that's a driver for a lot of the, the, the detailed information in both of these surveys that are collected. Um, so now in, in terms of the, the uh, phone survey for the charter mode, again, it's, it's to estimate effort in uh, vessel trips, numbers of vessel trips. The reason it's a separate survey is because it's conducted as an add-on to the more general for hire survey. And, and again, that's to try to minimize or reduce the, the response burden on captains. Uh, the, the for hire survey or FHS uh, is a list frame telephone survey as well. Uh, and within uh, that larger frame, the, the frame for the HMS or the LPS add-on is specifically those vessels that, that also have the, the HMS charter headboat permit. So that information is appended into the vessel directory for the for hire survey. And the add-on is conducted essentially with uh, just these, these permitted vessels that are a subset of the overall for hire survey. Uh, similar stratification with the private side, the main difference is that for the charter vessels, it's a one week reference period. Um, they also receive the advance notification letters. Uh, and, and again, calling for the one week reference period is done in the week immediately following. Uh, the reference period. Other than that, it's it's very similar. It's also trip profiling, and and there's similar detailed catch information, uh, detailed trip and catch information collected. So, to, uh, speaking a bit to to Spud's question as well, um, you know, this is the number of HMS permits by state and mode, um, but again, it's limited to just the states that are covered by by the LPS. So. Essentially, from Maine through Virginia, you have somewhere on the order of, of 10 to 15,000 um, HMS permits each calendar year. Um, and for charter mode, uh, the charter headboat permits, it's roughly on the order of 1 to 2,000, again, each year with some fluctuation. So that's sort of the scale of, of the, the effort survey frames or the, the permits. In terms of effort, I don't have a slide on this, but just to sort of give a sense of that as well. Uh, our annual private boat uh, LPS effort estimates in terms of vessel trips is generally on the order of 50 to 70,000. And again, that's Maine through Virginia and June through October. So 50 to 70,000 trips each year. And for the charter mode, uh, it's more on the order of 10 to 20,000 trips a year. Again, within that same range, Maine through Virginia and June through October. Um, so that, that gives a sense of the, the scale of, of these, uh, this overall fishery. Uh, so in terms of sample sizes and response rates for the, for the effort survey, the telephone surveys, from 2019, uh, as you can see, we had just over 5,000 completed uh, interviews with, with private boat captains and a bit more than 3,000 interviews with, with charter boat captains. That's for the whole range. Uh, of space and time. And response rates, as you see, are about 65% for private boat and about 60% for charter. Uh, and again, those response rates are helped considerably by the fact that, that uh, re uh, responding is mandatory. But again, there's, there's a limited amount of time to try to contact each of the selected captains. So sometimes it, Response, non-response doesn't indicate a refusal. It could also just indicate a uh, not able, not being able to contact the captain during the, the one week, one week sampling period. Okay, so shifting now to the uh, large pelagic intercept survey. Again, the primary goal here is to estimate catch rates uh, by species and disposition or catch type. So uh, landed fish versus uh, released alive, discarded dead. Um, those are the, uh, those types of catch. Uh, it's a dockside survey of captains, again, returning from uh, a large pelagic fishing, fishing trip. So it's, again, specialized just for that, those, those types of trips. It does not cover um, all types of, of recreational fishing. Uh, similar to the APIS, it has a complex design that uses stratification, clustering, uh, as well as uh, unequal selection probabilities or, or uh, uh, probabilities proportional to size. So essentially, the, the higher activity sites 
uh, have a higher probability of being selected. Lower activity sites have a lower probability of being selected. Uh, and the stratification, again, <laughs> is by state, month, and fishing mode. Uh, and, and as a reminder, again, we don't start sampling uh, New Hampshire and Maine until July. Okay, so some examples of the information that are collected in the dockside interviews. The two primary ones are, again, catch counts uh, by vessel trip, uh, for, uh, for vessel trip by species and disposition or catch type. And again, for bluefin tuna, that's also by uh, size class. Uh, and then we also collect several different vessel identification uh, and, and HMS permit um, uh, information. And, and this is because we have to, we have to, as best we can, accurately identify whether this intercepted trip uh, was taken by a vessel that is on or off of the effort survey frame. So this is correcting for the coverage um, of the effort survey frame. So again, this could be vessels that don't have a permit, uh, and that could be because they're either, you know, in worst case scenario, they're fishing illegally, uh, but it could also be because they were fishing for some of the LPS that, that don't actually require an, an HMS permit, such as dolphin, for example. Um, or it could be because they had purchased their HMS permit so recently that it's not actually on the, the effort survey frame yet. It would be in a subsequent wave of sampling, but it may not be on you know, during the current month. Um, and so to do that, the field samplers actually in, carry with them reference lists of the permits for their specific state and sort of neighboring state area. It facilitates the identification, uh, but they also record things like uh, the vessel, state vessel registration number that they can read, you know, directly from the, the hull of the vessel itself. Uh, vessel name and, and home port, for example, if it's a Coast Guard documented vessel. They also do try to get the, docu the, the Coast Guard document number for the vessel, uh, if, if at all possible. So multiple vessel IDs are collected to help with make that determination if the vessel is on or off the frame for the effort survey. Uh, there's also detailed information collected for boat effort. Uh, again, target uh, species, fishing location information, method, as well as some environmental parameters such as water temperature and, and the fishing depth where they were primarily fishing. Uh, and, and again, these are these help inform uh, in part the, the uh, indices of abundance that are calculated by the um, assessment folks. And then we also do collect uh, some individual fish observations such as length and for sharks um, sets when it can be determined. Okay, so a bit on sample sizes and response rates. Um, so in 2019, we had uh, over 2,300 individual assignments conducted and completed. That resulted in about 2,400 uh, interviews with uh, private boats and about 1,600 interviews with, with charter vessels. And again, overall response rate very high at 98%. At so here this does basically indicate you know, the refusal rate of, of roughly 2% uh, for the intercept survey. So a bit on quality assurance. Uh, again, we, we do standard interviewer training and, and performance monitoring. Uh, obviously, species identification is, is a big piece of that. You know, clearly, a number of the shark species are, can be very uh, similar and, and difficult to distinguish. Same with, with the tunas, also with things like white marlin and Spearfish, they can be difficult to, to distinguish as well. So species identification is an important uh, component of the training. There's various monitoring of interviewer performance, both for the telephone survey as well as the intercept survey. Uh, for the data, if there's a multi-step uh, QAQC process that starts all the way from data collection and continues through to estimate production and review. Uh, we are transitioning the data collection for the intercept survey to uh, electronic data collection. So starting in this year, um, we'll be doing a trial of, uh, of using tablets in the field to collect the intercept survey data, as is done with the more general uh, APIS access point angler intercept survey. Uh, there are data review meetings. There's weekly, weekly calls coordinating among the data collection partners. 
um, and also mid-season and end-season comprehensive reviews of both the data and the estimates. And then one uh, maybe sort of unique aspect to LPS, um, we track the refusals, again, because reporting is mandatory as part of, uh, as a condition of the permit. We track refusals and we coordinate on follow-up with uh, the Atlantic HMS Management Division, uh, specifically with, with Cliff Hutt, who, who Jackie mentioned earlier. And, you know, as needed, um, there is uh, outreach to individual captains on compliance. And uh, in general, that's where things typically uh, end in terms of restoring compliance with the surveys or reporting. Uh, but if needed, it can be elevated to, um, to law enforcement. Um, it, to my knowledge, it's not ever gotten quite that far, um, but, uh, but certainly that is an option. Okay, so again, just, just one slide on, on estimation. This is as deep as we'll get here, but again, I provided the link again, if, if, and I'm certainly uh, happy to answer questions as well if, there's, if people would like more detail. So again, the LPS is the primary source of the fishing effort. The LPIS, the intercept survey, is the primary source of catch rates. It also supplies an, an off-frame coverage correction factor for the, for the uh, effort, effort estimates. We multiply those two pieces together and that provides us with uh, the total catch estimates uh, for, for large pelagic survey. Okay, a, a little bit on the, the breakout of the estimates that we do provide because it's not, it's not quite the same as the more general MRIP estimates. So again, in terms of fishing for effort, starting with effort, it's vessel trips, it's not angler trips. Those estimates are available only for private boat and charter modes. Uh, they are provided by month as opposed to the, the two-month wave for, for the general MRIP estimates. Uh, and they're provided uh, at different geographic breakouts. Um, so here area is not the area fished that's, that we use for the more general um, MRIP estimates. These are state areas. So it's either individual or in some cases two-month, or excuse me, two-state groups. Um, and in the case of New Jersey, we actually split New Jersey out. And um, Jackie had mentioned that, you know, there's, there's a management unit split that can occur in New Jersey. That's why we, we have New Jersey split out. Um, uh, so that's a bit of a difference in terms of, of uh, how the estimates are, are made available compared to the general survey. Uh, in catch, it's, it's, again, similar different breakouts. Uh, for disposition, it's not exactly the same as MRIP. You're used, uh, you know, folks that are familiar with those estimates, uh, you know, recognize the A plus B1 uh, sort of combined landings estimate for uh, for LPS. We we there. It's a bit simpler. There's just kept or landed fish, and then released dead and released alive as as the primary different catch dispositions. Um, again, it's catch is also estimates are available by species and and for bluefin tuna that's specific to the size class as well as as an overall estimate for the species uh, again monthly estimates june through october the area breakouts that i had mentioned before uh, and then we also uh, produce length frequencies um, for lps species uh, if you've never used the lps estimates they are available from the mrip website uh, under both the, see my cursor, uh, under both the catch data section as well as the effort data section, there are uh, options for LPS that can be selected and those will bring up the, provide uh, you with the, the LPS estimates. They're not, they are kept separate and not integrated in any way with the more general MRIP estimates. Um, that is something that, uh, we would like to work towards, but there are a number of sort of um, technical challenges, um, design, survey design challenges um, that we can, uh, that we will need to work through to, to make that happen. But they are all available again uh, on our website through the query tools. Okay, and one last slide, this is on the, the redesign, a very quick summary of the redesign project. So. Within the LPS components, the redesign project is focused on the intercept survey. Uh, we are doing it 
in coordination with uh, MRIP consultants at Colorado State University, uh, principally Jay Bright, who had helped us with um, a number of uh, projects with the more general surveys from calibration to, to redesign efforts to the weighted estimation methodology. Um, and the goal for the redesign, again, is to uh, improve the intercept survey's design in terms of statistical validity, but at the same time, maintaining sampling productivity. And that's a key, uh, you know, from our perspective, that's a key component to this redesign, a key consideration, uh, because these are, in general, rare event species or certainly uncommon within the, the general recreational sector. And so we have to maintain that, that productivity um, in, within the, you know, whatever the new design is going to end up uh, being. So what we are testing currently is a design that combines both sort of fixed formal probability sampling uh, with adaptive sampling. And I, I have adaptive in quotes because it's not the sort of classic textbook adaptive sampling design, but rather um, just a general flexibility to move a subset of assignments that are based based on field conditions. So again, given the nature of these fisheries, their pulse, they're 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 more uncommon or rare. Uh, they can be highly you know affected by weather um, or different fishery conditions. You know, the fish availability are they moving through? What's the timing of of the pulse this year versus last year? Things like that. Are they influenced by larger sort of climate weather patterns? Uh, or regulations. Is the fishery closed? Uh, is it a short window of being open this year, the season, open season? Things like that. So again, this is an approach that, um, you know, a portion of, of the sample units would be done using fixed probability, known probability sampling, uh, and a portion would be allowed to move. They might be conducted as originally sampled, selected, or uh, again, based on changing conditions in the field, they might uh, be allowed to move. All of this done in ways that are accounted for appropriately in terms of weighting the data. And right now we are in the second year, uh, just about to start sampling on the second year of a three-year field testing period for this new design. Um, and I would say right now the design is looking promising, uh, but you know we're we're working. Uh, each year we do a different set of states uh, for the full sampling period. We, we really just couldn't afford to do all the states for all three years. So, um, so we really won't know until we get to the end if it's going to work um, for all of the states because they each have a, a unique mix of um, uh, numbers of sites, activity levels among the different sites, the geographies are different. So we want to make sure that it's going to be a, a design that will work well everywhere before before rolling it out. Um, so that's all I have on that, and that actually is the the full presentation. So thank you for uh, listening, and I'm I'm happy to take questions. And I guess I would ask um, before I I turn the screen back over, um, should I keep sharing or should I go ahead and, and sign off from sharing the screen? John, this is Chip. I'll take over and I'll have your slide show up. Um, so if we need to go back to a, a specific slide, we'll be able to go, go to that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Um, uh, enjoyed that presentation. It certainly helped me understand the LPS much more than I did previously. We'll uh, have an opportunity for questions here. And while we're getting those in the queue, I've got one. You, you, you mentioned that it's rare and, and has, I guess, never happened that you've had to elevate uh, to OLE issues of noncompliance. Uh, the question is, if, if it went that far, is, and I guess this is maybe projected to, is, is permit suspension or permit renewal denials a possible enforcement consequence? So I'll, I'll just say, uh, my understanding is yes, that that is uh, certainly an option, along with a suite of other, you know, fines, um, other possible enforcement mechanisms. But Jackie, please, please correct me or, or add if I if I'm missing something. 
No, we actually have that in our regulations, that lack of reporting, um, not meeting the requirements of the conditions of the permit uh, could result in, you know, something being revoked or issuance not continuing. But I will admit, I, I don't actually know of a single case where that's happened, but it's on the books as a potential possibility. Thank you. All right, uh, Bev, uh, you go ahead. Hey, John, long time no see, good to hear your voice. Um, I uh, I learned a lot on this presentation. I didn't know that much about this survey, um, so this was really interesting. I'm really interested in the idea that you're using a permit that's only for a subset of the species to estimate effort, and then you're, um, you're using intercept survey data for a larger list of species to generate estimates. And I assume you're, um, so I, I saw that you collect information on the vessel and whether they have the permit. I'm wondering how, how do you, how do you um, account for, for the differences in the under coverage that would be, you know, so people who are fishing for greater amberjack aren't required to have an HMS permit do you use a different um, effort adjustment for those species than you do for the HMS subset? Sure, Bev. The, the, both of the surveys, the, the telephone survey and the, the intercept survey, um, ask screener questions that determine eligibility. And, and those screener questions are the same uh, for both the the intercept survey as well as the, the telephone survey, so that the trips that are being reported uh, in both surveys align in terms of having the same the same eligibility. Um, so because of that, uh, we don't we don't do any sort of uh, species specific adjustments for frame coverage. It's just within that same universe of eligible trips, which align between the two surveys. It's, it's one coverage adjustment. You're right though. I mean, I think your, your instinct here is that, um, you know, the, there might be disproportionate, um, I'll say probabilities for a trip being off frame in the intercept survey based on what they were fishing for, but their, their eligibility is still the same. So the, the, the trips being reported through the phone, um, you know, would align with the trips being reported in the field in terms of their overall eligibility. Were you fishing for, you know, anything within this suite of species? And that's the same between the, the two. Um, so we make the, the single adjustment based on that. Um, but you're, you're right in that, um, you know, if you don't need to have the permit and you're fishing for, you know, a certain species, um, you know, that then you may or may not have you may or may not have it. We find a lot of people that, that fish for something like greater amberjack in this range very frequently also fish for one of the, the other species that do require a permit, and so they, they have it anyway. Um, but there are cases where, you know, and, and typically the off-frame, the, the vast majority of the off-frame boats are either, um, you know, don't know they need the permit or they got it very recently and they weren't yet on the frame. Um, and, and the other way that they can be off frame, even if they still have a permit, is they're fishing out of state. So the, the permit has a, a, a primary principal port state or primary state. Um, and if they're fishing out of that state, that's also considered off the frame because on the effort survey, I didn't get into this detail, but on the effort survey, we profile all of their trips, but we're we're specifically in estimating for the in-state trips um, for the, the effort survey. And again, that's because, uh, you know, the vast majority of the trips are in-state trips and there's, there's less precision on trying to estimate those out-of-state trips directly from the phone survey. So we, we collect that information um, in the intercept survey as well. So really it's the out-of-state that's the largest component of the, the um, that, that coverage adjustment, um, but, it, but it can be from other sources as well. So that was a long answer, sorry about the ramble, but if you, if you have any follow-ups, please go ahead. 
No, that's okay. You answered my question, but um, it does seem like that might be something that could be looked at in your redesign um, efforts. It might be, you know, a way to get a more precise estimate for those HMS species if you're not adjusting for all those other trips. Yeah, and we, so a, a quick follow up. So we have looked at, you know, for example, if we exclude all of all of the, you know, the the trips that that um, in from the intercept survey data that that caught something besides like bluefin tuna, for example, um, or or the other HMS, you know, what what do we see there? Um, let's say it's their trips that that were contributing to the off frame adjustment factor. Well, so that that does reduce the off frame adjustment factor, um, but it also correspondingly increases the catch rates um, for those other HMS species. And again, because of the design, there's there's generally sort of it's it's offsetting. So it would re reduce the the correction the, the adjustment factor, but it also increases sort of proportionally the catch rates for. Um, for those other HMS species. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Louise. Thank you, um, and thank you, John, for the for the great overview presentation. Um, I was just curious if you could expand a little bit on the on the full hire component. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned. The for the full hire component, the LPS is actually conducted as an add-on to the regular full hire, more general full hire survey. Um, and I'm thinking about this, John, in the sense of again, you know, data integration or how to handle the situation, situations when you have for the same species, you know, for the same area coverage you have these different estimates being generated. And any discussions that you may be having, you know, on that front, and I'm thinking about this in the sense that here, we're talking about, you know, considering some add-on, so to speak, or supplemental surveys that will be developed in the South Atlantic focus on snapper grouper species, you know, a la, for example, the, the state refuge survey, that we conduct in Florida. So when you generate those supplemental surveys, you're also collecting information from the regular, more general MRIP surveys. And I'm trying to kind of, you know, get us to the point of start a discussion. How do you handle, how do we handle, you know, having those different separate estimates that we don't want to be necessarily competing with each other Right. I mean, the idea here is to add, let's say, a module, kind of like what you're talking about here for the LPS. That would be a more specialized survey, you know, to the general survey uh, MREP conducts. And how, how do we how do we resolve those discrepancies? If you have any thoughts on that, or if there's any ongoing discussions there, you know, in that regard, regarding the LPS. Sorry for the long rambling question. Yeah, sure, Luis. I, I guess um, you know I would start by just referencing what I what I had said earlier, and that it's it is identified not just for private, um, you know, the the private mode uh, or private anglers, rec anglers, but also uh, for the the for higher sector as well uh, in the Atlantic HMS Regional Plan, uh, MRIP Regional Implementation Plan, as as a priority for for figuring out how best to integrate it, um, certainly uh, the, how to integrate the different estimates. So, and, and that's a, you know, it's recognized as a priority. The it's it's uh, it's still a to be done priority. Um, in terms of though the the surveys itself, certainly the more that that the different surveys can be integrated, specialized versus general things like that, and, and integrated at the data collection phase, it certainly facilitates integrating the estimates. And it also, you know, 
reduces reporting burden on the captains because they're not having to potentially report to multiple programs. And, and again, if it can be done at the data collection phase, and ideally even before that at the design phase, then it, it sort of you know, uh, can, can mitigate or, or help streamline uh, potential issues that might come up if it's done more you know, after the fact or, or ad hoc where, well, we have this existing program and now we need, we, we need to do something new and let's see how we can shoot, shoehorn it in uh, to, the, to the existing program. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had to, to work through some, some issues with that, I would say, uh, in the integration uh, with the for hire survey of, of the, the LPS add-on. Um, but I would say overall, we've, you know, it, this has been going on since, um, you know, the mid 2000s. So uh, at this point, I think we have, we've resolved um, much of that. So for example, functionally with the, the LPTS add-on, for the for hire survey, um, you know there are there are basically a, a small number of screener questions that I mentioned before, and they sort of trigger when the the additional add on more detailed LPS related questions are uh, are asked uh, of the captains or not. Um, so it's it's something that's kind of handled, um, you know, on 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 our end, and such that the captains don't have to, you know, they're not just all bothered with the additional LPS questions if they aren't relevant uh, to them uh, or their trips. So I don't, I don't know that I did a good job at answering your question, but again, yes, long-term, uh, it is a goal to, to integrate all of the estimates and work towards one set uh, for the for hire sector as well as, as the private rec angler sector. Yes, thank you, John. You did answer my question and, and you hit all the main points that I was hoping you're going to hit, right? In terms of us having this thought process, you know, now as we're discussing the development of this supplemental surveys and to be working closely with you and others on a regional basis to make sure that from the get go, right? We have surveys that are fully integratable that, you know, by design they are set up to to work together like this. And I think that will facilitate, you know, greatly later on uh, the use of this data, you know, for, for assessment and management. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Great, thank you. And thanks, John, for the um, presentation. I thought I knew LPS and still learn things today. Um, one of the, the things for this group, uh, considering South Atlantic, um, is just kind of a, a reiteration that LPS currently stops at Virginia and North Carolina border. Um, and I know that the implementation plan talks about the potential or the desire for for that to maybe move further south. Um, but when you look at the data or the the compilation of things for dolphin and wahoo and amberjack and species like that um do you on the private side um do you have suggestions for the work group on on ways that either emrip is addressing or the work group could explore on south atlantic private offshore data collection Uh, yeah, Jeff, and you may have to ask some follow-ups if I don't, if I don't um, sort of hit what you were you're hoping to hear uh, or hear addressed. Um, you know, I think so. Yes, you're right. Uh, certainly, it does. LPS coverage ends at Virginia, and um, you know, in terms of uh, expansion or possible expansion, you know, we it it's always been a funding limitation as far as why LPS doesn't cover, um, you know, the full range through the South Atlantic and the, and the Gulf. Um, and, uh, you know, the, and that's just based on what was, what's been historically available for resources for the LPS. Um, there would potentially be challenges, um, you know, in terms of, of the intercept survey, um, 
being efficient, I think, for, for some of the large pelagic species uh, further south. Uh, and, and so whether the current LPS as designed uh, would work without, you know, as is, is kind of an open question. I think there might need to be additional um, uh, sort of adjustments. But that's for covering LPS, not necessarily, a, you know, a consideration for reef fish or, or other species. It would really depend on how, how rare or not uh, in, an individual species would be within the overall general, you know, recreational sector. Um, in terms of sort of improvements to existing MRIP um, uh, survey programs, and I guess I'll speak specific, first at least specifically to APIS, the intercept survey component. Um, you know, we have uh, working with, uh, in, a, in a few cases with state partners, so uh, Bev and Luis with, with Florida, for example, uh, worked on adding, you know, a, an offshore dimension to the overall stratification of, of the, the intercept survey design. Uh, and I think that that collaboration worked really well. It allowed for the, the integration of, and I'm sure Bev spoke to this at your earlier meeting, the integration of uh, the intercept component sampling for both SURFs and, and, and APIS, or the, the MRIP uh, general surveys, you know, into the same, same data collection, field data collection effort. Uh, it, and again, it facilitates you know, incorporation of those data uh, and certainly limits sort of overlapping, uh, you know, field efforts. It's, it helps with the logistics of, of the field data collection. So that, that offshore stratification is certainly something that could be extended to other states, um, again, to varying degrees of success. If, if offshore effort is, is very diffuse, uh, meaning spread across, you know, a number of sites and it, at sites where it does occur, it's at very low levels and it doesn't tend to be concentrated in some way, say weekend versus weekday or late afternoon versus other times of the day. That certainly makes it more of a challenge uh, for the stratification to be effective. But, you know, I think there are, it, it, in many states, it would still be possible to create the offshore strata. And again, what that really is doing is um, identifying sites and, and say combinations of sites and day type, like weekend, weekday, or times of day, where it's more likely those, those trips tend to be more concentrated. There's a higher chance of seeing them if you go to that site on that day at, at that time. You've got a, a better chance of, of intercepting a, an offshore trip. Um, and so those sites, you know, can be, can be um, grouped together in their own stratum or in their own strata. Uh, and that's essentially, again, what was done for Florida. Uh, and we also did it uh, in Alabama to because their the validation component of their um, mandatory reporting capture recapture design for, for Red Snapper, the, the validation component is also integrated with the APIS sampling. And, and I think that is something in terms of that additional stratification, that's something that could be done um, in at least some other states, if not all of them. But with it, you know, it needs to be supported by sufficient intercept sampling. Uh, you know, if we're going to create an additional sort of dimension of, of stratification, there has to be sufficient uh, numbers of samples to sort of stand up those strata. Otherwise, it, it sort of, it, it steals, it, it dilutes the, the, the sampling um, from the existing strata uh, in ways that may not actually help uh, overall, but but again, I think that's that's sort of the the low hanging fruit, I would say, or maybe mid middling hanging fruit. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, the changes get more more challenging, and and perhaps more they require more resources to to implement. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I can't keep up with the statistics of it, but one of the early questions of the work group. And of of mine is, uh, it, which may you you may have a gut reaction to uh, is is it maybe for private angling all species South Atlantic, um, is there potential to take the Florida surf design and move it north? Is there potential we're taking the LPS design and moving it south, um, or are is kind of a 
a completely different approach um, likely to be more successful? Uh, yeah. So I think it's an unanswerable question, maybe. But um, <laughs> right, there's. So I would. I guess I would maybe just think a lot of it depends on the scale of the fisheries that that um, you know this new any new program would would need to cover. Um, and I think Spud mentioned this earlier is, are we talking about a handful of species, uh, ones that are exceedingly rare, or are we talking about um, covering a much larger suite of species like the entire snapper group or complex, recognizing that that still is a, you know, a relatively small component of overall recreational fishing. Um, so, uh, so it's a hard question to answer. I think there are, uh, trade-offs between whether you have, say, a vessel-based permit or an angler-based permit or license um, uh, in terms of, you know, efficiencies or, or coverage considerations, you know, sort of non-sampling error uh, considerations, speaking more generally. Um, and those may or may not be influenced by what the, the end goals are. You know, do you want to cover, again, a lot of species, a small number of species, what's the reporting? going to you know the reporting burden going to be those are all things that uh, not an exhaustive list but those are all things i'd want to consider in trying to pick amongst different programs i, I would though you know definitively reiterate or, or support um, some earlier comments that it would be beneficial to have a single design perhaps with some tailoring as needed but a single basic design within your you know region of management, whether that's a council region or or something larger or state level, what, you know, whatever it is, it would be nice. It, it's ideal to have a common design uh, for, for comparing estimates. And, and again, you, you may have touched on this at the, the earlier uh, meeting, but it, it greatly facilitates comparability of the estimates across time and, and across space. Thank you, John. Fan of that yeah. Uh, compatibility. Yeah, those those are all the the tough issues that we've got to to deal with. And uh, any other questions for John? I don't see any hands raised. So thank you, John. Uh, good presentation. Good good discussion. Oh, got Bev's hand up. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I just want to squeeze one last question in there since you brought it up, John, about the the vessel-based versus angler-based license. I know the vessel-based uh, license in the LPS survey is probably what allows you to do a phone survey instead of a mail survey. I'm curious what uh, what are the response rates in that phone survey since it's coming from a, a license frame rather than a random telephone survey? Sure, Bev. That's, um... And Chris, I don't know the exact slide, but somewhere in the presentation, there there are the response rates for the um, for the phone survey components. Uh, yeah, a little bit further back. Keep keep ah. going back. That's the intercept survey. Yeah. So so there you see them. It's it's about you know 64, 65 percent for uh, for private boat and, and about 60 percent. And and that that's 2019. That that's that 59 percent for charter. Has actually gone up a good bit now that um, uh, the the state partners and, and, and ACCSP are conducting the the um, the four higher telephone survey on the Atlantic coast. Um, they uh, that's raised the response rates for charter from you know about 59, 60 percent to I think a, a bit over 70 percent, maybe closer to 75 percent. So. So having having the the permit, I think, uh, and and the mandatory requirement for reporting certainly helps uh, with response rates. Uh, but even even that, though, I, I should point out, you know, it it has come down some. So private boat used to be within LPTS private uh, the the phone response rates used to be closer to 70, 75 percent back in you know the early early to mid 2000s. And we have seen, you know, again, this sort of erosion over time um, uh, in the response rates. But 
again, a, a 60 to 65 percent response rate is still very high uh, in terms of, of survey sampling, not just fisheries, but just in general, federal surveys, you know, private sector surveys. That's a very high, uh, high response rate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly higher than the male surveys for MRIP or our survey. It's really interesting. Thank you. Sure. And, and, and I guess one, sorry, just one last add on to this. You know, the telephone survey is also greatly facilitated by just the overall size of, of the, uh, the permit frames and, and the sampling rates. You know, if, if, the, if the sampling, if, if the frames were a lot smaller, um, you know, the, the telephone calling might get overly burdensome. You know, we would essentially be calling the, the same number, the same people very frequently, and, and that might get, get irritating. So another type of contact might be more preferable. If the frames were much, much larger, so again, you know, the, the private angler frame is, is um, sort of between 10 and 15,000 permit holders each year. If it were triple that, let's say, um, you know, at some point, the, the, the calling would get either, you know, much, much more expensive or perhaps just unworkable. Uh, it's just logistically not affordable to, to do telephone calling. So there is, I think, sort of a, you know, an optimal sweet spot, if you want, for, for frame size and, and sample size uh, for telephone, telephone interviewing. Um, and, and, the, and for LPS, fortunately, we're, I think, in that range. Yeah, and I, yeah, I know you worked with us on the, the SERPs design, and that's why we went with a mail survey, since it was an angler-based, with a lot of oversubscription, it would just be really expensive to do a phone survey for that. All right, uh, thanks. That sort of brought up something in my mind. Bill, can you rem remind us of how many SERPs Permits, Florida's issuing annually, approximately. We're currently around half a million. Yeah. That's uh, required on the Gulf and Atlantic coast. So I can't tell you how many of those are due to just Atlantic coast fishing. Fishing. But it's a big number. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's a very big number. All right. Well, well, thanks again to all the presenters. Uh, good information and certainly gives the work group food for thought. Uh, good questions, good discussion. Um, you know, we're going to keep this process moving forward. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes left in our allocated time. Um, I want to move on to uh, a work group discussion of the topics for our next meeting. Uh, we, we've got a lot of information presented to us over our first two meetings and uh, what else uh, is out there that we need um, to help us start focusing in our discussions uh, on recommendations back to the council. Uh, I think there's some fundamental uh, questions we need to answer. Um, I think one thing that keeps coming out of this is uh, the desire to, to have whatever we recommend be compatible uh, with MRIP and be in addition to and not in place of. Uh, and if there work group members that feel differently, um, I certainly want you to express those opinions. Um, you know, obviously Florida has, has led the effort on the, in the South Atlantic region. Um, I think, you know, the starting point for us when we get down to deliberating the recommendations is, you know, is, is the Florida survey, um, what we need to consider expanding up and down the, the South Atlantic region. If so, what are the, the pros and cons of doing that? Uh, also, um, are these other existing surveys, do they present opportunities for, uh, for modification and expansion? One question I had, I guess, for, for Jackie and John that I forgot to ask is about, about what's the staff commitment to supporting uh, those those data collection programs just in terms of like TEs. So this is Jackie. So in terms of kind of the the issuance of the permits and the reporting, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. What is yeah What does it take to to, to make it happen in terms of, of people? Yeah. So we probably have about let's see. Uh, 
three FTEs and a contractor who are kind of managing uh, the data, um, but we also contract with a separate group who built our system for the kind of online for the users to go and actually issue their own permit um, and then built the, the program where they can report in the database where we hold the data. Um, so that was like a separate contract that we have that we continue to contract on um, on a you know a yearly basis we have them working for us too so it's it is a a large commitment. Right. And John, your, your LPS team, what was this? Uh... Sure. So for the you know our uh, within Office of Science and Technology, there are essentially three full-time um, staff, uh, one FTE, two contract positions uh, that support it at, at our level. And again, that's that's mostly, you know, design, uh, operations coordination and estimation tasks. Um, getting down, if, if you're interested in sort of it, for the field sampling for the intercept survey, um, I believe there are roughly 40 uh, samplers again spread throughout the, the 10 states with a mix of you know maybe a quarter of those are closer to full-time and the, the other three quarters are, are part-time uh, for the you know for again for the months in which the, the survey is conducted so I don't know if that gives you a sense of, of scale but um, uh, but that's what I've got yeah yeah, thanks. That, that's helpful. All right, so I want to open it up to the work group uh, for comments, discussion about uh, going forward. What information do we need? Is there something out there? Uh, and just a general discussion about uh, how to make progress. So if you just raise your hand. All right, got to uh, start off with Mel. Yeah, thanks, Bud. I had a number of observations, but one thing that came to mind is going back to our our goal uh, statement. So our goal is basically to improve estimates of catch effort. So I think we need to have a, a, a clear understanding of how we would measure uh, success towards improvement. You know, do we, would that be reflected in um, improved PSEs in, in data? Uh, is that our measure of success? Is part of the measure of success, uh, perhaps in the public's mind, uh, you know, the fact that they, at least we've heard, a, a number of them are very interested in participating in in this sort of thing. So public participation, or willingness to participate, is that a measure of success? Because you know we have, it's it's real clear that we're from a standpoint of um, having the technologies and the people that know what they're doing. And I mean, we're not, we're not short on any of that. We, we've got the uh, technological capabilities. We've, you know, we've got all these different types of programs up and running that do the things we needed to do, but it's just whatever we might come up with um, to recommend uh, for a sort of a build, building something new that we want to be compatible um, and, and useful. Uh, you know how do we how do we measure success for those improvements? We just need to have a because you don't want to build something brand new, um, and then you're you're kind of right where you were in terms of if you're measuring it based on you know data quality or, or PSEs or something. Or, uh, but I I think that would be good to to talk about you know next time or something or as we move into this because uh, and again uh, I think it was Dee talking about public perceptions and you know part of this is going to be managing public perceptions in all of this and, and expectations because uh, there is an expectation from the public that something improves which is how do we measure that improvement I guess is what I'm getting at be good to think about yeah and I think you know following along those lines there's there's also I think an expect an expectation or perhaps not totally realistic that 
if we improve the accuracy and timeliness of data, then we can be a lot more adaptive and flexible in management prescriptions. And, and while that's not necessarily directly incorporated into our goal statement, I think it's implicit in there that if we have better data, it's more timely, more accurate, more trustworthy, then, then we hopefully can make better decisions that synchronize, you know, our, our management with with current stocks data. So, uh, Luis, you're up. Thank you, Spud. And, and uh, I was thinking about completely different issues, but I agree. I think, you know, Mel brought up a very, very important point, and, and you as well, Spud. Uh, and that kind of reminded me of a general presentation that I've seen that MRIP staff uh, presented. This is to that, uh, you know, the National Academy study that's that's in its final stages now. But in the very beginning, they came in and they gave us an introductory presentation, and they brought up this issue of criteria, right? Uh, that we look at recreational fishing surveys, and criteria that would be desirable would be timeliness, precision, and adaptability. And I thought that was a, a great way to sort of frame that discussion. And, you know, as a potential suggestion there, well, perhaps we could invite them back to sort of have that discussion, you know, revisit uh, those issues and discuss how those things could uh, come about or improvements uh, to what we have on the table right now you know, that we're obtaining just through the general survey. But uh, going to a not so pleasant uh, side of things, <laughs> uh, I was looking at the objectives as well that you, you brought up earlier, you know, the overview introduction, SPUD, and, and I thought, well, we have covered some of those bullets already, and we are getting to the point <laughs> where you know, getting to bullets three and four, which are review the legal and logistical differences between state versus federal fishing permits, including implementation, financing, and enforcement in federal and state waters, and then evaluate the feasibility of state permitting and data collection programs for collecting information on recreational fisheries in federal waters. Uh, eventually, you know, we're going to have to look at those issues as we as we move forward with this, this program. So uh, that will be my recommendation as well. I don't know if that would, you know, be a good fit to be discussed with the other topic that now uh, brought up, but something that, you know, might be on the agenda for, for future meetings. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Luis. Yes, that was one one of the reasons I was asking questions about the, the staff commitment and all this. That you know, I think a lot of us would would like this, you know, any supplemental survey to to address the need for better information on snapper grouper complex or a subset of that. Uh, we would like for that to be incorporated into federal funding. Uh, perhaps that's not realistic. And if so, then that, that leads us into a whole other set of discussions is, is, is listed in the objectives, and that is what, what are those barriers? You know, it's one thing to have a state like Florida uh, have the political will and the funding to, to create a refish survey. Then you go to a state like Georgia where you have a very small percentage of the, the recreational fishing community is actually targeting snapper grouper, and, you know, the dynamics are completely different. So. Anyway, uh, Chester, you're up. Thank you, Spud. And uh, I wanted to thank the presenters. I found the stuff about HMS to be really very fascinating. Um, I think to Mel's question about how do we measure success, and to me, success w would be that there is a perception on the part of the general recreational fishing public that management 
is uh, what coordinated with what they're seeing on the water. Because a lot of the angst that we hear about is you know, red snapper, of course, being the perfect example again, that they want to know what it is that we think we're doing. They want to know how we could possibly be so wrong. And we repeatedly are invited to get on vessels, recreational vessels and, and uh, in particular, and come out and look at what is actually going on because our management doesn't match. And I, I get back to uh, managing by like perhaps extraction rates, uh, and other things that, that are really in addition to the, uh, or I, I should say, are part of the master part of the data collection issues. And so, to me, again, when we get to the point where the fishing public is saying that they're satisfied and they are happy and they understand and uh, encourage us to go through with our different management schemes, I think that is success. And with that, I will close. Thank you. Boy, I would love to live in that world, Chester. I really would, where everybody was satisfied. And, and uh, I think we can certainly make steps towards improving satisfaction and trust. Uh, but it's, it's tough. I mean, we, we, we deal in a, in a very complicated world in the recreational fisheries, you know, millions of people targeting different species at different times and some coming back to publicly uh, accessible locations as going to private. It, it's always a, it's a challenge. So Mel, go ahead. Thanks, bud. Yeah, with the Chester's uh, comment there, yeah, that that's certainly perhaps in some of the public's mind success is a different outcome or a different result from what they're seeing right now related to a particular species or decisions that are made. So that's that's part of the that's part of that managing public expectations. What really are their expectations? Uh, but I did the same thing uh, Louis did, or Luis did. Um, I looked at you know the objectives and all, and I would agree we kind of touched one and two and three and four as he pointed out or kind of open the, and you've mentioned this as well as when you start getting into the state piece of this um, not all states have equal capacity or ability um, you know to to do certain things some states um, you know have more resources to work with and and that sort of thing so that'll be a, a bit of a challenge and if we kind of go down the road of of the states doing things it it needs to be something all the states can can do, uh, you know, or participate in. Uh, we just need to be sensitive to that. But I, but I agree. Yeah, we three and four in terms of the objectives there, uh, or, or we haven't touched on that uh, related to the for the fifth objective we had, which was develop clear goals for data usage, um, and that kind of gets back to uh, I don't know the the concept of um, okay, we're going to do this a little differently now. We're going to have uh, some new data or something, but how are we going to use that? And you know, how do we ensure that you know, we've okay, we're we're MRIP compatible or whatever? But how are we are, are we acquiring some new data that we don't have? And is that and again that gets back to if we're filling a gap somehow that that exists, is that and that becomes a measure of success? We're filling gaps, but I think uh, understanding what we're going to do with this new thing call it a new thing that we build or a new thing that we integrate into the system. We just need to be real clear on, you know, how we're going to use it and how it is able to become uh, MRIP certified, as we said in objective six, uh, how will it fit into stock assessments, you know, uh, and then how will it eventually help with management uh, plans. But whatever it is we build, we have to have a clear understanding that it does the thing we need it to do, and it meets the standards related to to uh, when we've talked about that MRIP uh, 
uh, integration or, or, or usefulness. So again, whatever it is we build has to provide us something that we don't have right now. So we just need to be clear on that as we we'll call it, build this thing, whatever it actually ends up looking like. That's it. Yeah, maybe maybe one thing that we need uh, to resolve too is in the past when uh, we discussed the possibility of there being you know, supplemental regionally focused surveys to MRIP, um, you know, they involve some sort of permitting or, or whatever you want to call it at, at the federal level that would be administered by NIMS. We've, we've always been told, well, the resources aren't there, so that's not, you know, that's not a realistic expectation. And, you know, and, and that is, I think, what in a large part had to do with, say, a state like Florida taking the initiative and on their own, seeing a need and, and addressing that need uh, through their own governance structure and their own resources. And uh, I, I guess, you know, that the answer to that question is probably still the same. Um, I don't know that for sure. Maybe that's the question that needs to be asked directly. Uh, to whoever would be the appropriate person. Maybe that's a question you could ask, Mr. Chair, Bill, and, uh, and we can resolve that once and for all, because if, the, if it is going to fall back to the states to be responsible for implementing and executing uh, a supplemental survey to, to MRIP, then that, you know, that's, that's a completely different conversation. So, uh, Luis, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Spud. Real quickly, just to that point that Mel made about developing clear goals for data usage, you know, I remember a presentation John Carmichael uh, gave, you know, talking about what were the gaps, what are the issues that the Council has been facing on the snapper grouper species, right, that go beyond just the really rare event species, some of the not so rare, I mean, relatively speaking, as John explained, you know, reef fisheries are a smaller, much smaller component of the total number of trips. But, you know, still, we have some that are not necessarily completely rare events. Um, so John identified in that presentation something that, you know, help us, helped us see where are the gaps? Where are the things, you know, the timeliness is not there for, for us to be able to really manage the, the species properly or the data precision uh, and timeliness may not be there to support assessments at the level that we need assessments to be conducted. So that might be another presentation and discussion that would help us see, you know, what the, the main gaps are now and then identifying clear, clear goals for this data usage. All right, thank you, Louise. Uh, anyone else? Um, here's your opportunity. We've got about another 10 minutes. I'd certainly appreciate any input from the other work group members. I know this is a, it's a formidable task. I mean, this is why I described it the way I did at the beginning. I mean, this is sort of the holy grail. You, we're trying to find something that that, that fulfills all our needs, but yet is uh, can be implemented, can be executed, and, and accepted uh, by the private recreational sector, and is not unreasonably burdensome. And uh, that's always a, a tough thing. I'll throw this question out: um, without miring ourselves down in the minutia of what's going on in the Gulf. Um, would it be useful for us to at least have some sort of situation report on on what's going on with red snapper in the Gulf? Uh, because you know, out, sort of outside of that environment, you know, there's lots of different versions of what's going on. It might be good for us to understand you know, where where have the problems arisen? You know, with with state survey based estimates of effort and catch not being compatible. Um, again, you know, I want to take up our time with something that isn't uh, useful, but it, would it be useful to the group to have um, you know, a short presentation on kind of where those points of conflict are and what's being done to resolve them? Mm 
Any thoughts along those lines? Jeff? Um, Spud and group members, I, I'm struggling with what we would gain. Um, I think John pointed out and, and the group has discussed before that a consistent and compatible approach is preferred. Um, I, I would hazard the, the lesson from the Gulf is different methods without a calibration make it more difficult in the long run. Um, and I would be comfortable stopping at that level of summary um, for for our task ahead in unless the request for a presentation was um, you know more of a lessons learned and compatible directions to that they would have to recommend to us. All right, thanks. That's a good point. Uh, D. Go ahead, D. Sorry, she was more muted by an organizer. She's unmuted now. All right, D, you're ahead, okay, D. Now, now you can hear me. Um, actually, I, I wouldn't mind uh, maybe an objective presentation. Um, maybe not really from the Gulf, but uh, Jeff's comments are intriguing me. I don't know much about what's going on in the Gulf at all. Um, and compatible or not compatible, I think, I, you know, I'd like to see the whole, um, the gamut of both. Uh, because, you know, part of me is, um, you know, what if you weren't compatible with Embrip, if you could design a better system? I, I know that is not the charge of this group, but, you know, I just feel like the public would like us maybe to, to talk about that. And I'm not for that either. Um, but, you know, what are the lessons learned if we build a compatible system that if we want to build whatever it becomes, um, that we can learn those lessons. Uh, so, but just, and that's just because, I, you know, uh, I'm on this work group, but I, I haven't been following Red Snapper really much at all in the Gulf, except, you know, reading a little bit of news headlines and stuff like that. All right. Thanks, Dee. Uh, go ahead, Mel. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was just wanting to make sure I was clear on what you were uh, talking about related to the Red Snapper and Gulf. This was the fishery dependent side, not the fishery independent data things that are, were going on. And and I, of course, am interested in, uh, you know, what all is going on down there uh, related to, to Red Snapper. Uh, so again, from a, you know, kind of an objective presentation kind of thing and I certainly uh, understand Jeff's points there uh, but I, I wasn't really sure what all you were including in that potential kind of presentation or briefing yeah that was my, my main uh, purpose in, in even bringing it up was you know obviously there have been some some problems arisen uh, with you know the state of Mississippi and the state of Alabama, and you know it's 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 complicated because you know, you're talking about the currency of CHTS estimates versus FES estimates and all these other kind of things, and some of that you know it, it is not directly applicable to our situation, but I think it might be useful for us to at least have have some kind of perspective on it uh, because yeah, we, we're, yeah. we're in an interesting situation because we oftentimes talk about the inadequacies of MRIP and in both conversation and in writing. Uh, but yet, if we talk about improving things by incorporating something into MRIP, then you know the, the fishing community kind of looks at us like, wait a minute, now you're talking out of both sides of your mouth here. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we don't do the right thing. It just means that. You know, if you if you talk about that MRIPs can't be used for this and can't be used for that, and then you turn right around and put all your eggs back in that basket, it can appear to be, you know, you're a little bit uh, schizophrenic. But uh, anyway, well, Bev, you're back up. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone um, for the February meeting that we had, um, Luis and I provided a reference document. I was trying to find it online. Uh, someone did a really nice review of 
um, the, all the surveys in the Gulf and some of the issues around them. Uh, and we submitted that as a reference document, but I'm not seeing it now. But maybe whoever was responsible for preparing that report could give a presentation. Okay, we'll see if we can we can track that down and and uh, but what I'm hearing is there is some interest in, in at least uh, uh, having some some current information on the situation in the Gulf uh, so we can benefit from it so we can I can work with John and everybody to see what we can come up with. Uh, Jeff, thanks, but um, when you say situation in the Gulf with regard to red snapper, that's that's kind of a broad topic. Uh, if what we're what you're suggesting is that we take a look at some of the different surveys that the states did and then take a look at what some of the problems were from the standpoint of validating their surveys so that they could be acceptable for management use. I, I would love to see that presentation. If we're talking about also incorporating a discussion of what has gone on in the Gulf with regard to red snapper and the, I, I call them the snapper wars. Uh, I don't want to hear any more of it, quite frankly. No, that was not my, my intent would be to focus on the uh, kitchen effort surveys uh, that are being done at the state level and also being you know done through MRIP and, and some of the issues that have arisen, not, not the great red snapper count, not all these other, other things that are going on. So, Jessica. Thanks, Bud. Sorry, I, I missed all of our good discussion that we were having and I I don't, it doesn't appear that any of this is being captured on the screen anywhere that I can look at, but I had to take a bathroom break since we didn't have any of these in this meeting. But um, I would like to see at some future meeting if this is going to end up being a state survey that would have to be conducted by the other states. So Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. One of the things we talked about before was um, an overview of the state's process and any challenges or maybe barriers to implementing a state survey, including the length of time it would take them to get it in place. You know, if there was going to be a fee, it would have to go through the legislature. If no fee, maybe not. Um, maybe legislature only meets every other year. Just those types of things. Um, so I, I guess, and I I thought I heard somebody mentioning that earlier, but I wasn't sure if Spud, you were suggesting that we need to learn more about federal process first before coming back to the state. And that's fine. It's just something I'd like to talk about, hear about and understand at a future meeting. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. I think that is one of our priority needs uh, for the next meeting is, is to better understand the state governance structures. And, and how that would affect uh, our ability to implement a, I guess, a uniform survey across across the region. Because my my uh, comment about the, the federal process was just, you know, is is the door still shut on, you know, NIMPS administering some sort of supplemental survey that involves permitting a subset of the private recreational sector. Uh, I think that was probably still yes, but uh, I think it's worth asking just to make sure that that answer is still yes. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Justin. Uh, Beth, go ahead. Yeah, I did. I found that report. It's the title is "Better Defining the Universe of Offshore Recreational Anglers," and it's a report and recommendations of the Marine Fisheries Advisory Committee. It was done back in October of last year. It's a really well written report. Right. A lot of good lessons learned in there. That might be more productive than having all the states come in and talk about their individual surveys again. Okay, all right. We'll make sure we, we get that back out every nice aware of it. Bev, can, Bev, can you say that name again? The title of it? Better, Better defining. defining the universe of offshore recreational English.
Okay, my, my clock says 12.01. Um, respectful of everybody's time. Any, any of the suggestions, and if it's something that comes to mind later, uh, just certainly send me an email or, uh, or John, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure we get it in the queue. Uh, for our next meeting. Uh, this has been good. Uh, we're uh, a lot of information presented to us, but I think it's going to help us uh, distill down um, to something that we believe is, uh, is realistic, but yet also uh, produces a result that's uh, worth the effort. So, uh, Mel, some comments? Yeah, thanks, Bud. Appreciate you running all this. And shoot, it's not Manhattan, is it? Um, real quick, did we have an expectation for about when we would want to meet again? I know we've sort of been operating on a, a every other month kind of schedule, I think. Um, let's see, that was the last one was February, so now it's May. It's actually been a little longer than that. Um, we just do a Google know. or something to uh, kind of check with folks then? Yeah, I guess we could. I mean, we've got a We've got a council meeting in September, uh, you know, um, before or after that, maybe. Uh, you know, like we, we can certainly do that since it's the group and see what folks' inclination is. So, okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of the group? If not, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate your participation and we'll generate a report uh, from this meeting that summarizes everything. And uh, like I say, if you've got any suggestions uh, for the next meeting's uh, topics, just uh, send it to me and, and John and Chip and we'll, we'll get it in the queue. So thanks everybody and y'all have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.